Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pied. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the hardcore legend, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I finally got invited to your house. How about that? You know whose house I've never been invited to? Who's that? Vince McMahon's. Really? Jericho's been there. Austin's been there. You know the deal where yes. it's been said if they have if they have no plans for you, you meet with a bunch of people. Yes. If they have plans for you, you meet with Vince and maybe one other person at yes. the office. But if they have big plans. The rocket strapping. You go to the house. That's right. I never... Never went to the house. Well, I'm glad that you're here because you are indeed, <laughs> as we heard from the theme song today, Mr. In Your House. You know, that's, can I just. <sighs> you're in my house, Mick. It finally happened. I I'm am, excited. I know, but it's just that I'm grateful to have my own theme song. Yes. But that's, it's over a year old. Well, that's fair. And I don't know if everyone knows the inside joke of Mr. In Your House. They do know my WWE music. I think it's about high time we play the WWE entrance. Okay, uh, Silva, if you can, you're a crack producer here, and by that, I mean you're maybe on crack or know how to source some. If you could find the WWE, oh, just no, throw no, in no, the no, Google no, machine. No, 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 let me. Mick, we can get it. We were ready, no, but we can I get it. I want the music played live. Like it's a WrestleMania entrance? Like here, yeah. Like I've never had, well, Nita Strauss played my entrance twice, and I want that type of attention to detail. Nick, live. it's uh we're in Huntsville, Alabama. How, yeah. That would be pretty hard to source. Not necessarily. Okay. What, what do you have in mind? I've got my own musician with me. Okay. My son, Mickey, is going to play Wreck by Jim Johnston. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Commission Yeah. How about that, man? That was awesome, man. My Great own job. live entrance. That's our first live musical performance on any of my podcasts. On any podcast, was, really? That was pretty awesome. You never had like a symphony orchestra to come in and do the theme from Space. No, we've never actually done that. But you know, it does make me think. Like hypothetically, do you know any other wrestling theme songs? Like, uh, yeah. Well, some of them, some of them are in different tunings. So it might be harder to play. But I know some. I just gotta think. Well, you know, well, you know what? I know that there is a piece of music you play. Who one of my associates, colleagues from ECW, used to use the Metallica song. Enter Sandman. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's true. I could play that. You can play a little Enter Sandman? Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. Let's yeah. go for it. My son, Mickey, on guitar. The Sandman theme. Here we go. <laughs> Awesome, two for two. Damn, that's super cool. Mickey, dude. tell Uncle Conrad uh, how many lessons you've taken. Year. Wow, self-taught. 
Yes. Same with drums too. We got him. Uh, how many years ago did you get your drum set? First that was time? close to ten. It was January 2014 for my 13th birthday. So close to ten years ago, and I played on this little kids Mendini, five year old. Right? Yeah, I think it was Mendini. Probably so was. We figured it's ninety nine dollars. All right, it's the top of his uh, his uh, Christmas list. We'll we'll waste ninety nine dollars, right? Just so he can be happy on that day. It was his birthday, actually, right? Yeah, his birthday's birthday. only a couple weeks after Christmas, and about two weeks after he got the kit, Noel and I are upstairs and we hear this sound downstairs, and Noel turns and he goes, "Is that Mickey?" Because it wasn't just somebody messing around with the drums; it was somebody right. playing drums. And we, we go downstairs, we see this 13-year-old on a kit meant for a five-year-old, and he's just playing the heck out of it. And he just he just took to it, you know? Yeah. Um, and set, the guitar, probably a couple of years that you would tinker around a little bit, you know? And Yeah, I mean, I remember I got a guitar for Christmas in 2009, but I had no clue to play. And I, once in a while, I'd like, touch it and be like, oh, but like, I didn't know how to really play. It wasn't until like, probably a some months after I started playing drums where I started trying to play guitar. So probably like mid, mid late 2014, I started to try to play around with it. It wasn't really until like 2015 ish when I actually could play some actual chords and stuff wow. like that. So yeah. well, that's awesome, mm -hmm. man. He's Thanks. Super cool. And and one time I, with no training whatsoever, this was after you played drums, this is talking about the jaws theme. He's never played piano in his life. And all of a sudden, I don't Halloween. I hear Dun, 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 I could do dun, Jaws dun, also. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> this was like 2011 before I even started playing drums. I started I know, I was like, trying to do that. How does he just some people have a gift, you know, and he, he works hard at it. But, uh, uh, you know, I've talked in the past. I know Mickey's, he's, we're going to have him reassessed because I don't know if he's still on the Well, <laughs> reassess, it's not for, it's not for that. You're getting things oh, Okay, up. okay. But, Two different uh, things. It shows how much you were paying but attention. But a couple, a couple of years ago, we, we weren't even... badass. That's what, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what, that was really impressive. But anyway, he's that. just doing so well. Yeah. He's such a pleasure to have around. So I was just glad to get him in here. He did, he knew we were going to see Jason Isbell and Margot Price. Yeah. He's, he didn't know it was today. I didn't know it was today. It's I not really his like, type oh, of music, you know? Would have brought more food. <laughs> so... Yeah, because she's now hitting the weights I have for the to first hit time. my daily calorie intake. And oh, there you go. Like yeah. 2,700 calories or something like that. Oh, but you know how you some people would say something that could be seen as a weakness actually becomes a superpower, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yes. So Mickey would go to Guitar Center with me, and I'd know whenever we went in there, I'm in this for the long haul, right? They're going to have to kick this kid out of here. And he would think nothing of working on the same chords like 200 times in a row. So that when he sat down and he started playing, uh, which oh, come as you are. song? Yeah, come as you are. Was a spirit one of those? A, I think it was come as you are. The the clerk comes over, and this is a guy who's been working there for years. Yes. Has heard, seen, or, er, heard everybody and his brother play different songs. He comes over, he goes, "I've never <laughs> heard that played so close to the album." So well, it's weird though. I was in a different tuning than the original song. I, I was, the original was in D standard tuning. I was playing E standard, which is like two tunings above it. So it technically didn't sound exactly the same, but to him it sounded exactly the same. It's mainly the chorus effect, like this type of, it, that type of sound effect that I guess that gave it, made it sound like more like the original. Just real quick, show them how, you want to play the opening chords to uh, Teen Spirit? I just want to show how it goes from the clean chords to the distortion. Sure, I guess that's I have a the guitar for it. That's, that's a distortion cool. pedal, right? Yeah, it wasn't the one that, like, I have the actual pedal yeah. he used. That's when I was obsessed with trying to sound like him. But, like, I didn't bring it with me in this one. But this one, it still, it does the same trick. Same and then we will get to wrestling. After we do this, yeah. we'll get to wrestling. And, by the way, uh, I have it on good faith because DDP told me, smells like Teen Spirit sounds nothing. Like his theme song. <laughs> Not at just, all. Just like totally how. Totally different. Man in the Box by Allison Chain sounds nothing like Tommy Dreamer's theme song. <laughs> right. <laughs> Totally yeah. different. Bro, bro, it's not even close. Yes. They go. It's like the vanilla ice. <laughs> yeah. Ding, 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 yes. ding, ding. And yes. I go, ding, 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 da, da, ding, ding. <laughs> yes. You just said the exact same thing. Yes. Okay, so ready? It's a, oh, okay. All right. I hardly gonna... play this anymore. I haven't played this in a while. But I just think like... it's cool yeah. how it shifts from the clean chords to distortion, okay. right?
I was thinking any minute we're going to break out in some yoga in here. Dude, that was awesome. Thank oh, you yeah, so yeah, much yeah. for that. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Now, I, what? I'm, all, I'm done now. You're, do, you're down. Oh, you, shoot. I'm not even talking to the mic. You want to sit and listen to the podcast? Maybe chime in once in a while? Sure. I'm Maybe good. the last thing we do is you can share the story of your haircut, okay? Yeah. That's okay. a giant big deal. <laughs> How many years had it been since you got your haircut? Uh, 11 and a half years. Up until May 31st of this year. <laughs> so your last haircut was in 2012? 2011. What day? Uh, okay. uh, November 2011. I don't remember exact date. It was probably like mid-November. But And why from November of 2011 <laughs> until May of this year did you not cut your hair? Well, for a while I had a fear of haircuts. So it's like over time when it got to a certain length, I was, well, it went from just full-on fear then to just being like, oh, it's this long as it takes so long to grow back now. And then it was kind of just like had it just for an obsessive compulsive reason just so I could be like oh look how long my hair is even though I was like oh it's a lot of hard work to take care of it and I I, just, I don't actually think it looks that good <laughs> and how long did your hair get it was at max I measured it the night before I got haircut it was 43 inches long oh wow yeah it went like a foot past my waist yeah. it was like down that's here. as tall as Dave Silva is <laughs> 43 inches wow. Oh, wow that's really impressive uh so uh, how do you like having a haircut now? Um, I like it a lot better. I, uh, it's a lot easier to, like, showers are quicker, and it's brushing it isn't a pain. It's just like, okay, I'll brush it for, like, 40 seconds. Meanwhile, when my hair was 43 inches long, it take like it would get all knotted, and it would take, like, 45 minutes to brush, and it would be, like, it'd just be, like, ah, painful, and then I have to stretch my hair out over here trying to do it and I'm like, oh, this isn't very fun and then I'm going to have to do it all over again sometime soon. So when do you think your next haircut will be? Probably in the next week or so. I was kind of thinking of getting it trimmed because it's grown out a little bit. It's kind of like shoulder length now. It was a little above shoulder like a few months ago and I got My wife did a lot of research. She found, she didn't want to just go to a barber. Right. She wanted to find somebody who can give him some style. I'm I like love the, it. I was like the only guy there. Yeah. It was embarrassing, but it's like. But, uh, you came out with a cool haircut, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah looking great. Thanks, Mickey. Thanks. Love How about pal. that, man? Yeah. A little, uh, little fo uh, Foley family action here That's and right. our first musical performance. And man, you've been awfully busy. I'm, I'm loving the shirt. I loved your appearance <laughs> on hot ones. Tell us about it. Uh, I mentioned, uh, that the gentleman who did the interview did all kinds of research, right? So he asked me about the Hallmark, uh, Christmas movies and my fondness for Christmas from in back Pemberley Manor. And I admitted that I, I think the reason I ranked it so highly, I may have had a pandemic crush on the actress Jessica Lowndes, and I, but then as time went by, the new pandemic crush became Janice from Friends, and that one's hanging on there. This is, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> Ideal. <laughs> like, I mean, with the print, too, behind with the it, print, it's so on I, brand for you. I said, I said on the show, I, I got to the point where I'm thinking of having Pro Wrestling Tees make a custom shirt for me. So I sent Ryan about four different photos and an idea. And then the way they are, they just exceed your yes. hopes. And he sends this to me. I was like, ah, oh, this is magical. So it's not licensed, but it's one of one. And uh, I've got the word out there to actress Maggie Wheeler to see, like, can I get her blessing on this? You know, That's like, pretty cool. I don't know if I should have asked, but I just feel like it's not licensed. I'd like to know if she's okay with it. I'm like 90% sure that... How could she be mad you're wearing it? She can't be mad you're because wearing you've it. Because you've seen me with the Parkinson family shirt, right? Yes. I think people are catching on. I, Mick's only got like three shirts. How many oh. shirts? I, I have like four, right? The kids say, oh, is that your new Marv well, you shirt? You keep giving them away at your shows, too, though. I do. Well, I sell the shirts right off yeah. my back. I probably have, uh, uh, during the entire course of uh, Most Wanted Treasures, maybe seven T-shirts that I wore. And uh, the kids will say, is that your new Marv shirt? Because yeah, I was just about to say that thing with a joke. Yeah, Noel bought shirt. me, Mar Marv, to me, one of the great... 100%. One of the great characters and a guy who could take some... He raised the bar about... What, he was the Cactus Jack of my family movies. <laughs> it was. It was. Oh, and by the way... Um, I would, when you start talking about Marv, I was like, 
I was about to say it loud. Oh, I think I know where this is going to go. <laughs> I didn't expect it to go here. Not me either. Mickey this wasn't planned. does a dead-on imitation of Marv getting electrocuted. <laughs> Okay, for, so we're talking about the Home Alone movie, if you're not keeping up with us. And there's the Wet Bandits, played by Bandit. Joe Pesci, and the phenomenal person who does Marv, who's name. Can you guys right tell I'm really proud of my son? Yes, we can. And I'm excited to so, see this. this so so first of all, voices. he does, uh, who's Marv's partner? Frick's his name. Uh, <laughs> wait, why am I? Wait. Joe Pesci. Oh, 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 I thought you meant yeah. like he's. Name yeah, the movie, his I name in the of movie. It. Marv. Uh, Marv, Harry, Harry. Harry, Harry. So is it, ha no, Marv tries to warn Harry that uh, Kevin McAllister's throwing bricks, right? Yeah, Marv, yeah, Marv does. A taller okay. one. He tries to warn Harry, okay. Joe Pesci being like, uh, he, so then he's about to throw There's bricks. There's enough and, of a wrestling reference yeah. here. Okay. All right, because I think, yeah, Marv is the Cactus Jack, and I also uh, made an analysis of all the injuries that would have been realistically I occurred. See. Remember, in Foley is, uh, Foley is good. Yes. So it was in the book. So now here is my son Mickey doing Marv, trying to warn Harry about the and impending. This is, keep in mind, a few times after Marv already got hit with bricks on his head. So this he's kind of out of it when this happens. So he's on the ground, and Joe Pesci, <laughs> Harry, standing up, and he's like, oh, what are you doing, Marv? And then Marv's like, wake you up. You want me to hold the microphone so you can use your hands to gesture? Wait, what, does he even do anything with his no, hands? No, no, but for the electrocution nah. he does. Okay, go ahead. Okay. He's like, and then, and then, and then uh, Harry's like, he's like, why? Why are you doing it? And then he goes like that. He gets hit in the head. That's pretty good. And now. Then the electrocution. The electrocution, I'll, I'll hold, hold this that. out. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, this is him about to get electrocuted. He grabs onto the whatever he's holding on. Just imagine my hair is becoming like an afro. <laughs> and he turns into a skeleton. <coughs> and still came back for more punishment. <laughs> that's my man the right Cactus there. Cactus Jack of family movies. I'm sitting there in the movie theater. I was like, that's who I want to be. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mickey. I appreciate it. How about you. that, man? Appreciate you, buddy. The real star of the show today. Yeah, for, for sure. Just uh, and by the way, can I just compliment that your beard is looking mighty fine and it's smelling pretty good, too. Oh, Thanks. God. Uh, okay. <laughs> Reason being, it is the Folietti blend. Okay. By Mythical Beards. I've only I've only pitched for it one other time, uh, over a year ago, and they were getting in close to the Christmas season, and I I love it. I gave one to you and one yep. to Dave, and it's now hypoallergenic and vegan, which is oh wow. Nice. We substituted uh, plant oils for the uh, emu oil. And so it's every bit as good. And uh, the, the story behind it is the guy kept sending me samples. Right. And then my reply was, it needs to be stronger. It needs to be stronger. And then after the third sample, I said, let me put it this way. I want people to feel like they got hit in the face with a peppermint patty. And he said, as a rib, he sends over like the highest concentration of peppermint oil like he could think of, thinking that I'm going, okay, that's so much. I went, perfect. Nailed it. And it's really, it's really invigorating, you know, especially I don't have the big beard anymore, but you come out of the shower, you put a little on, it's tingly, it's really good for all the dry skin. And that's why I think you can reasonably say that I look okay for someone at my age who's been through what I have. Partially Throwing through. off of buildings and set right, on fire. Right, right, Yes. And um, this is the only beauty product I use. So I'm pretty, uh, so if you want to. Surprise somebody, mythicalbeards.com. Uh, and the hair's growing out, too. You notice that, right? Are you, are you going? Uh... I'm going to give it one last shot. I stopped uh, about seven months into the quest when I was doing the uh, 20 Years of Hell uh, tour because I was saying these words on almost a daily basis. It's not a perm in reaction to people ask me if I got a perm because it just curled yes. up so much. But in this way, I'm kind of fighting it. A, I'm trying something new when I get out of the shower. I'm brushing my hair. That's and, a new thing. That's a new thing. Okay. And also going to the barber for a little bit off the top while the rest grows in. Now, realistically, uh, I'm, I mean, I make my living 
trying to make people feel the way they did. So if you have that 25 hair. years ago, and I never had the big beard, you know, that's, that's the primary reason why I don't wear the big beard anymore. And besides, I can do my Santa stuff almost as well with a really good theatrical beard. Yes. But uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to give it a try. I, I'm not going to dye my beard, you know, I look, you know, looking back, you're like, who did I think I was fooling there with the jet black beard? <laughs> Um, so I, that natural, everything's gonna be natural, but I just, when I meet someone and I do a couple of these cons uh, a month, yeah, you want them to kind of feel like they did 25 years ago. So do we have a goal in mind? I know it's not going to be 43 and a half inches, but <laughs> I, collar, cactus jack level collar. Maybe. No, no. I remember DDP told me after I did, uh, the today show, uh, I, I'm, Halloween of 2000. Mickey, Katie Couric held you to close out the show. I did. Must have been 2001 because I looked a little yeah, too yeah. young for 2002. October so. 2001. I, uh, I came back from my segment and I was like, where's Mickey? And Colette said, Katie has him. And she closed out the show with Mickey dressed as a pumpkin. Uh, and DDP was like, bro, that's as long as your hair should be. Which was about collar length. So I think I'll try to go collar. Yeah, we'll see if we can get it. I, I think like it's it. six, seven more months, maybe maybe longer, but I think I could do it. You mentioned Halloween. That's going to be what we're talking about today. We're going to be celebrating Halloween havoc and, and your uh, circumstance with Vader leading into maybe my favorite Halloween havoc match of all time. Thanks. I think that one and the one with Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio, two totally different matches. Oh, yeah, yeah. But my goodness, what a story. Uh, where does Halloween Havoc rank for you? I know you're Mr. In Your House, but you know a lot of old school NWA fans consider Starcade to be like the their WrestleMania. Eric Bischoff would say, no, it was actually Halloween Havoc for us. Really? When you were in WCW, did Halloween Havoc feel like the biggest show? It was the biggest show for me because it was, uh, I mean, I had the main event program with Sting, but the real payoff as far as uh, pay-per-views wasn't until... A while later, mm -hmm. uh, it, not including the, um, <laughs> what's the Halloween theme match from '91, the Chamber, Chamber of Horrors. Of Horrors. And when people ask me about that, my answer is always: There's a reason why there was no Chamber of Horrors. Two, two, yes. Uh, but as far as singles, solo singles matches, maybe my match was staying June Beach Blast, June 1992, could have been considered a main event, but it didn't go on. Last, whereas the match with Vader at Halloween Havoc was the main event, and at that time the biggest match of my career, so much so that uh, I described one specific moment, and I'm I know I'm jumping ahead, sure. but uh, you know this this match happened. It's a matter of factual. Uh, sorry for that. Matter of historical fact. Um, I was kind of making a comeback of sorts outside, or maybe I was just piling on the offense on Leon early on in the match. I can't remember which. And I grabbed a fan's camera well before cell phones, right? So it was a legit camera. Hit Leon overhead with it. It shattered. So I'm sure the fan was excited about that. And then I looked out at the crowd, like, you know, with a glance in my eyes. And as I as I kind of looked further at the crowd, they followed me with the cheers, almost like a mini wave. And I remember vividly thinking to myself, this is the best moment of my career because I've never been this high before. And also the saddest because I'll never get to this level again. So luckily I was wrong with that second assertion, uh, but it was the biggest match of my life, and uh, it was up there in my top ten for a long time. I don't know if I'd still put it up there, but Leon was not the type of guy who went over a lot before. I mean, there were certain things he went over, um, but it was he liked working with me because it very closely resembled resembled. A real. Yes. It was as real as you can get. <laughs> it was about, yeah, as real as you can get under those circumstances. And I like rising to that occasion. Um, I was just in the UK last week, and somebody mentioned that they were at my house show match in Manchester, only about an hour away from Liverpool. And I said, you know what's funny is someone else mentioned that a couple of years ago and said, I turned to my friend and I said, I can't believe 
they're doing this to each other at a house show. And I said, that's so funny because that's exactly what I was thinking while it was going on. Yes. I can't believe we're doing this during a house show because it looked like... It a real fight. Like the, yeah, the, and the last... It looked like it was the last match I'd ever have. So I, I compared it at the time to like the way it was my Ali Frazier. Yes. So I geared up for it like it was an epic... Um, you know, an epic collision, and they were. I put everything I had into them, and then as we explored this match a little bit, this one had a little extra because I was actually tr actively trying to end my wrestling career in that match. I, I'm I'm fascinated. I know we've we've touched on that story before about you know you getting squished on the ramp, yeah. and, and we're going to touch on it again today, but. I'm fascinated by what you said earlier about looking out through the crowd and feeling like this is the highest of highs, the yeah. best I've ever felt, but also in, in your mind, sort of waiting on that other shoe to drop, knowing it'll never be here well, again. Well, I already knew based on future programming that it wasn't, there was no potential for it to succeed and go further. You know, that was one of the big drawbacks to me of filming at, uh, it was MGM Disney. Hollywood Studios, yeah. now it's just called Disney Hollywood Studios, is that you knew two months in advance where they were heading. And I already knew no matter what I do, no matter what the buy rate is, Leon's going to work with Sid, which WCW, I think, considered the much bigger event. And so I, I had to put it all out there because I did not think I'd have another chance to perform at that level. Ultimately, uh, we know that didn't wind up happening. Right. The whole Sid feud because of the circumstance with oh, yeah. Sid and Arn in the UK. Do you think you were ever seriously considered for that Starcade match that ultimately Flair got against Vader? Because you guys had just torn the house down. I could see that as an, a super underdog story mm, and a rematch. Uh, well, I think where the ball was dropped was after I lost my ear accidentally in the match in Germany. And, uh, you know, I, I very seldom get negative, right, on this show. Um, it didn't take a lot of imagination to see why that could be hot. Yes. Um, and that is my belief as to why it wasn't pushed is because it wasn't in the cards. So I think this, you know, that was a gift from the wrestling gods. You couldn't write that. You couldn't script it. And even though we'd had our little run and the ear was lost, I guess, uh, five, six months later, we could have kick-started that with a couple promos. Let me get into just wrestling psychology here for a minute, way deep in the weeds. When you're saying things like you could tell it wasn't in the car, it's talking right. about losing the ear. Because yeah. you're right. It does feel like a no-brainer. Hey, we got to use this. This, right. w this is easy to do. But when they don't, do you surmise in your wrestler brain at the time, okay, they don't see me at that level. They see yes. me at a certain spot. Yes. And even now, I think I wasn't a big enough name to headline Starcade. I just, I mean, that's Halloween. Even if, if, even if EB says that was the main show, I think in uh, those 90, uh the rest of the booking committee may have yeah, thought differently. I, don't, I think you need that. Uh, the same reason that WWE goes out and gets celebrities that people... Yes. Are, you need a household name. And there were not that many of them in WCW at that time. It was Rick. Sting, it was, it was maybe. Rick, St Rick, Sting, Luger, Rude. I think those were the guys. And Leon was, the be you know, to me, the best heel in the business at that yes. time. So I... I uh, yeah, I know. I, I had no qualms about not being in that. I mean, and, and Rick and Leon had an epic uh, encounter that it night. It was amazing. Yeah, I remember Rick kind of downplaying it because we had a match, and then I, I said, Rick, no, I was, I was there. I remember the way it made me feel, and I've seen a lot of great flair matches. Everyone in the crowd felt the same way. Everyone felt that way. Yes. And it was partially, you know, I mean... Uh, you know, Rick gets emotional quite a bit, but he has family there with him. I don't think Rick knew he'd have to go into that. I'm not talking about going to that gear from a conditioning standpoint because he can. No, but he got busted up and in the mouth. He, he got up busted in the mouth. It was a real and fight. It brought for out, yeah. It's it looked like it. Yes. And I thought it was a great match, as great as so many of Rick's classics have been. It was different. Yes. 
And like the funk we're all in 89. Yeah, it was different. Yeah, it was different. And every once in a while, different is really good. Yeah. Well, I, I know a lot of young talent listen to our show. And you've, saw, you've talked a little bit before about how. Oh, yeah. Really? I get messages from people who really, really dig your wisdom and advice that you drop mm. on the show. And I, I just want to talk about you know, betting on yourself because yeah. we saw Cody do that when mm -hmm. he felt like Vince McMahon and WWE at large saw him at a certain level. He left, bet on himself, mm -hmm. came back a much bigger star. We see what they're doing with him now. You sort of did the same thing here in WCW where once you knew they weren't going to do anything with the year, you probably thought, okay, now's the time. Like there's it's my the same, same scenario, but more so than when I left in 1990 read the writing on the wall, just thought, man, I know I've only been in it five years, but just work too hard to have one guy, not here to demean Ole Anderson. Uh, and, and in retrospect, it's the best thing that could have happened to me because I was, I was thrilled to death with my lower, mid, yes. top of the bottom position. Could not have been happier, but I didn't want to mean nothing. Yes. And that's what I thought I would. So I bet on myself there. When you go from $300 a week wrestling three times a night, six times a week, which is what I was essentially doing in Continental. Singles match, tag match, battle royal. And you're making 300, and now you go to making 15, you're making 500% more. To go back into the wild world of, unknown world of independent wrestling where my asking price was 250, so you're saying, okay, I'm gonna make 500, the goal was I'm gonna make 500 a week. If I work every weekend, 26 grand, I'm gonna pull in. But I was more than willing to do that because I wanted to reestablish. I wanted to establish that I could be more than I had been. Yes. Uh, and that I could work with main event people. And so I bet on myself in 1990, and I bet on myself again in 1994, which was even more difficult because now in '94 I've got two children. Yes. I've got a mortgage. We've got a you know nice house, and I walked out on a you know low. It's low six figures, but it was still six figures back when six low six figures really meant something, right? That was going on uh, thir 30 years ago. I mean, 30 years. 30 yeah. years. Yes. Um, I'm all, I really, I really respect people willing to do that. Drew yeah. McIntyre did it as well. Yes. Uh, Young Bucks yep. going off Impact TV and making a big name for themselves. And, uh, you know, when I read Drew's uh, memoir, I really liked that he brought up the idea that the, the usual way people do it is they come around for a certain price. When they come around again next year, the price is lower, yes. and then it's lower, and they mean progressively and progressively less. Yes. And Drew will admit, you know, you, there are times to go out there and be that guy from WWE TV, but when it really counted, like with Insane Championship Wrestling, uh, and I know we're kind of getting off the subject. And no. I, I know I've talked about this before. People need to know, just from the onset, I rarely text the powers that be. Right. You know, And in this case, um, uh, I texted Hunter after I, Drew sent me something. I wasn't close friends with Drew by any means, but I liked him. And he sent me something. He said, hey, I know you're busy, but I'm not even going to do the Scottish accent. Yes. You know, I said, um, but I'm working on something different. I did something for... Uh, ICW in Glasgow, can you take a look? First thing I did, and he'd only been gone like a month. I texted Triple H, I said, I know you just released him, but you need to keep your eye on Drew McIntyre. He's like an entirely different person. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to go there, and, and, you, and you may find out by betting on yourself that you're only as good as WWE told you you were. Right. But man, the two dirtiest words in the English language, what if? Yes. Uh, b besides titmouse. Uh, that's, actually, that's, that's, that's one word, right? Uh, okay, I, I, okay, but you get the point, right? Yes, yes. I, don't, I, I mean, I'm really big on not being that guy. And I've had some failures, you know, yeah. in, my, in my day, you know. I mean, I wrote two novels that didn't sell well. I've done a lot of things that I haven't done what I hoped they would, but I'm not going to be that guy sitting on the couch 10 years from now going, Wonder what, what if, if? What yeah. if? So I feel really good about that, and I think wrestlers owe it to themselves. Oh, uh, Matt Cardona. Yeah. You know, I, I know I've been on record dropping f bombs saying f Matt Cardona, but hey, I mean, that's you're having fun. We're having fun, right? That we're having fun. 
um, I don't really give time to people I don't like. You right. know? So I'm going to mention some of these because I like them. But Matt put out a thing when all those guys were released saying, trust me, the work is out there if you're willing to work hard. You know, yes. but I think he said bust your ass. Yes. And it is different because there's no guarantee. There's no biweekly check. It's up to you. You go out there, you prove your worth. But uh, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because when I met my wife, Colette, and you saw the, the show um, – in Huntsville. When yes. I saw. Now, the main reason I'm doing a show December 21st in Nashville at Zany's is because Colette's never seen the show. Really? So I want to do one last show of that tour. And granted, you know, it is stories that people heard, you know, a year ago. But it's like, it's such a, I think the stories about her and the way she helped me yes. find that, believe in myself. And to do it with humor, I, I, I really want her to be that, be there so she can hear it uh, uh, firsthand. Um, when I made at the end of the year, within maybe $20,000 of what I made in WCW, but I did it myself. That's amazing. And I was suffering greatly because yeah. I, it was ECW, it was IWA Japan. Japan. I was paying a toll, but oh man, and I don't know how many years I could have done that. Right. But I was really, really happy uh, that I had tried, that I wouldn't be that guy wondering, what if? Well, those are wise words for a lot of people who uh, recently got their walking papers from WWE and they've their 90 days isn't up yet, but I'm excited to see what that wrestling journey looks like for a lot of those Me folks, yeah. uh, including somebody we both think a lot of. It looks like Arn Anderson's son, Brock Anderson, is going to be finishing up with, with WWE Ooh. or AEW. Uh, I'm excited to see what's next for him. Me too. You know, he's been so, his dad was such a big part of your career over the years, and <laughs> I'm pulling for him. These. The first time I heard Brock speak, it was like, you're not just looking at Arn. Yes. You're listening to Arn, too. Yes. Arn had that great sense of humor, that low key. I was like, I mean, I, this is literally the first thing Brock said to me. I said, I said, oh, my goodness. It's like looking in a mirror. He goes, I know it blows. <laughs> <laughs> if you have an opportunity to see Brock live, go out of your way to do that. Uh, just a great guy. And I'm excited for us to talk more about our topic today. Of course, we're talking about Halloween Havoc 1993. Um, it's hard to believe this was 30 years ago, is it not? I know. I know. It's crazy. So by now, you know that Mick and I have spent a lot of time talking about some of these death matches and some of these bloody wars that he had. But you probably also know that that blood was intentional. You see, nobody wants to get cut accidentally, but unfortunately, a lot of us do it. If you're using a cheap razor, you're getting those nicks, those cuts, that irritation. And I got to tell you, I got pretty annoyed with that whole subscription razor concept a few years ago. I found they just kept stacking up. What I enjoy most about Henson shaving is that it doesn't feel like a gimmick. It feels old school. Seriously, just the actual blade handle itself. Dude, it's metal. It's not some cheap piece of plastic that's going to break on you or frustrate you. This is like, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to last a lifetime, but it feels substantial. It feels like something our grandparents would have used. And at the same time, man, you get a whole pack of these straight razors. Dude, this is old school. But here's what's cool about it. And here's why I believe that you got to meet Henson Shaving. They're a family owned aerospace parts manufacturer that's made parts for the International Space Station and the Mars Rover. And now they're bringing that same technology and engineering to your shaving experience. You see, I've learned that razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more the wobble. The more the wobble, well, the more nicks, the more cuts, the more scrapes. You see, a bad shave isn't a blade problem, it's an extension problem. So by using aerospace grade CNC machines, Henson makes razors that extend just 0 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. That means a secure and stable blade with a vibration free shave. It's also got a clog free design. You see this razor has built in channels to evacuate the hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. Seriously, Henson shaving wants the best razor not the best razor business. Let me explain. There's no plastic. 
There's no subscriptions. There's no proprietary blades. There's no planned obsolescence. The Henson razor works with standard old school dual age blades, but it gives you that, that new age, that new school tech. I mean, dude, these folks have made stuff for space. You darn right. They can make stuff for your face. And once you own a Henson razor, it's only like three to five bucks a year to replace the blades. I'm a big believer in this. I was overwhelmed with the value. Seriously, you're going to get more blades than you can imagine. In my first shave, I have to admit, I was a little intimidated. I haven't worked with a straight razor like this before, but dude, it was easy and I felt like a badass when it was done. I'm going to tell you, the design is incredible. The durability is awesome. It's super affordable. My buddy Cassio Kid came over to watch the Royal Rumble and I had told him about the razor before and I said, hey man, I got to show this to you. And I showed him the blade. I showed him the razor. It's, it's something you got to see. I recommend it. It's the most manly thing you can do today. It's time to say no to subscriptions and say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley to pick the razor for you and use code Foley and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure you add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G.com slash Foley and use the promo code Foley, hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley. It's, uh, of course, in this era, there is no nitro. WCW Saturday night is, is sort of the way of the world at the time and the way we're telling those stories. Uh, you know, I know we've touched on it before, but I wanted to ask like that studio style show at a center stage. Yeah. Well, it's not technically a studio, but it's not a huge arena. There's not, you know, tens of thousands of fans. Not that there were many, that many fans of WCW at the time anyway, but well, we were doing pretty strong ratings on Saturday nights. I just mean the live events. Oh, the live I know events. you would run house shows that would struggle at times. They would, WCW. yeah. I mean, there were times when we'd have 3,500 in a 15,000 seat venue, and that was considered a pretty good crowd. Yes. There were other times where they had to do some major jostling of the camera angles and the the the, the hard camera side um, in order to create the impression that there were more people than there were. I wanted to get your take on that center stage style presentation, especially from like a WCW Saturday night approach. Yes, there would be some big angles. Yes, there might be a couple of big matches, but there were enhancement matches and it really was more of a studio yeah, show. Yeah. And I feel like that's missing in today's wrestling. And so when a lot of people talk about, you know, well, this company's not drawing as well, or that company's not doing as well, or, you know, people are just critical of the product in whatever direction. I ask myself, hey, what was missing from when we were kids, when we were knee deep in our fandom to now? And I think enhancement matches and studio style matches might be part of it. So a few weeks ago, when NXT was heads up with AEW, man, it really stuck out to me how different the NXT show felt because it was presented more like a studio mm -hmm. show and a more intimate audience. Do you think that that has a place in today's wrestling? Like, do you think that say AEW dynamite or collision or rampage, or is there a, an opportunity for an impact or someone like that to really double down on that look and feel? Well, I mean, Billy Corgan's NWA did that. Yes. I, I remember, uh, edge describing it as a love letter to the wrestling of the, the eighties. Yes. And it really is. And when I did go there and participated at one of their events, it's amazing how much talent is out there. I mean, just great, really good workers, seasoned workers, people who've been places, I think we're in a position where there might be too many good workers just for, you know, the the handful of American promotions. But I do I like the feel. I did like that feel of going out there. I, I believed we may have overdone the enhancement matches at yes. some time. I think we covered this in our Bill Watts episode where I said when Bill came back in, he not only wanted less um less competitive matches, right. but I mean, Bill was so old school that he didn't want the close-ups because he didn't want, God forbid, you see someone going over a spot, but right. now it's like, but the close-ups are what brings the connection. Yes. So I think it's like trying to put the genie in the bottle. As, yes. as soon as World Class came in and had the, the guy, I mean, they did it with guys actually in the ring or, yeah. you know, the cameras right there in the ropes, but they were bringing those personalities into your television in a way, into your living room in a way that nobody else had. 
And so I thought that was a major error on Bill's part by trying to go back in time and do all enhancement matches. But I do believe in the power of the enhancement match and that it works when done sparingly. And the crowds get behind him. Remember when Braun Strowman yeah. was just destroying people? I mean, and they, he had that match with James Ellsworth. It made Ellsworth. Yeah, it made Ellsworth. Uh, and I'm uh, trying to think of the guy's name. He was one of the guys from Three Count in uh, WCW. Shannon Moore. Shannon yeah. Moore. Yeah. Shannon Moore did a match, an enhancement match for, uh, I believe it was Matt Morgan. Do you have a cup of coffee in WWE? Or was Perhaps, it? yeah. And... Shannon Moore did more to get him over with the reaction he had on his face than anything anyone could do physically that, oh, my God, I'm going to get killed. I don't like when the, the enhancement guys go out there and they do the, hey, you know, they should look nervous, nervous, scared. scared. That's And I wasn't crazy. Ah, man, I mean, I know I'm speaking ill of a beloved, a beloved figure, but, you know, there were. I didn't think Gene Okerlund did a good job of selling any danger whatsoever for the heels. And I think that's important. And I think you get that partially through the enhancement matches. And, of course, you know, you, you get a lot of respect with good matches. But as far as actually suspending disbelief where you believe that somebody poses a danger, and I've gone on record on our show saying one of the things that's missing is that we have everybody fighting for a win. Yes. But monster heels would make you feel like you were fighting for your life. That's right. And that you'd come off after doing your impressive thing, I want my announcer to, and I know that I would sold for people when I was a GM, even when I was a commissioner. I didn't want to be the toughest guy in the building and that I would be afraid of the undertaker, yeah. you know, and that I would show trepidation towards, towards people. I think it, it's, I mean, it's, if there was a textbook on how to get over a textbook on how to run a wrestling company, anybody could do it. Uh, you don't know what works until you find out what doesn't work. And I said, I know we're jumping all over the place no, here. But uh, I said, we were given the, the luxury or freedom to fail during the Attitude Era. Not too much, because if you had three consecutive 15-minute segments that did not do well, you were looking at a move down the card. But I'm glad we had a chance to fail and not get chewed out because of it. You know, there were some things I did that just didn't work like I thought they would. There were a few things where Vince said, Mick, for the record, I don't think it's going to work, but I trust your judgment. And they didn't work, but at least I had the chance to put it out there. So going back around, I do think there's a place for the enhancement matches, especially if you're trying to get over uh, a really imposing figure. You brought up the great presentation of World Class, and, uh, man, I got to ask, did you see that trailer for the Von Erich movie? Wow. What did you think? Whoa. They made, whoever's responsible for the cinematography made it seem like that sportatorium was alive and kicking on yes. a Saturday night. I wish Carrie looked more like Carrie. Yes. You could argue over the fact that David was in real life was not nearly as imposing physically as Carrie, whereas in the movie, Zach Efron looks a lot better than their Carrie. And I've heard that there are, you know, they tie loose ends up conveniently, uh, but the every biopic does that. Sure. So I think it looks great. You know, uh, from what I've seen, I think it looks really good, and I'll probably be there opening night to see it. I really wish someone had reached out to me as a consultant because I was there. You know, I mean, I was there at the tail end. I only worked with Kevin a few times, but I worked with Carrie a dozen times at least, maybe two dozen. I think they were in production, and at some point during production, they hadn't reached out to David Manning or really Mr. Von Erich. So. We'll see. But okay. I, I, as a fan, I loved the footage, and I couldn't help but get goosebumps when I saw the outside of the Sportatorium building. It was like, wow, they did a great job on this. You know, I had a chance to meet Billy Crystal one time at a uh, uh, Yankees game. Back Mike Wazowski. <laughs> Mike, yeah, Mike Wazowski. Thank you. Uh, back when I had some juice, because George Steinbrenner was a big-time wrestling fan. So once or twice a year, I'd get to sit in the boss's box. Oh, life was so good back then. Yeah. And Billy Crystal was in there, and I said, Billy, I could tell how much you loved making, I think it was called 61, 
uh, the HBO show about the Roger home run. Yeah, Roger yeah. Maris. And they made the old Tiger Stadium in Detroit look and feel like the old Yankee Stadium. Don't know how they did it. Don't know how they made that venue look like the Sportatorium because it's gone. Okay, I believe me because I went by the corner of Cadiz and Industrial and it's not there anymore. Just rubble. Just rubble. Um, but my, yeah, they 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 made it come alive and I it made me feel good because I had some really special moments. There. I think it comes out the same weekend. You're doing your zany show in Nashville. Really? So. Maybe make it a double header with the missus. Perhaps I will. How about that? So listen, we, uh, we left off, uh, most recently talking about your series of matches in WCW Saturday night in April of 93. Of course, the idea is, uh, Vader is, uh, just laying waste to you. You're going to go home and be off the road, uh, for a few months. And of course you get a call from Tony Schiavone and you wrote about it in your book. I really felt like I was on top of the world. I could finally spend quality time with my son and wife who was now one month pregnant with our second child. And I'd just come out in one piece from a daring angle, which would no doubt set the box office on fire. When I returned, I was confident that when my contract rolled over in four months, I would be well compensated for all my sacrifices. Everything was going to be just fine for the Foley's right. Come on now. This is WCW. <laughs> we're talking about here, a company that could screw up our wet dreams, whoa, sacrifice, whoa. dedication, loyalty, <laughs> They were seemingly foreign words to my employers. Of course, they'd screw it up. Uh, so listen, <laughs> you got to be frustrated. You get the call from Tony, and Tony tells you that you know they feel like there needs to be some humor in these vignettes that you're going to be shooting. Um, so Janie, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Yes. Uh, I have a meeting with Dusty, and... I noticed that I turned, I remember my Graham telling me months before that, hey, we need, and we discussed this in a previous episode, uh, we've got a number one guy. We don't have a number two baby face. We think you can be that guy. Like, there's no way I'm going to eclipse Sting. Sting. It's, it's not realistic, but they think I can be that number two guy. So when I turn, and I turn against Vader, that really cool little angle we did where Harley Race is trying to figure out who the tougher guy is between me and Orndorff. And I talked about it in my book how Paul Orndorff comes up to me after we did a few matches on TV and tells me he's just signed a contract. And he thought the matches we had were a big reason why. Yes. And he shook my hand. And I'm thinking, this is Paul Orndorff yeah. who I watched on TV. A few of the biggest gates in North America. Yes. Uh, set a business on fire with Hogan. Uh, granted, Hogan's the man, but you need everyone needs a great heel, yes. right? And Paul Horndorf was a great heel. So we had this little run where I make my I, I make my big baby face come back, coming out of the stands in uh, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and things are going well, except. I'm not getting people behind me when baby when heels are getting heat on me. I surmise it's because for the better part of two years, fans have been told I don't feel pain. That's right. I thrive on it. And so I, I mean, it's a little conundrum. It's How can a, it be sympathetic yeah, if you enjoy it? Right. So when I do the uh, meeting with Dusty, I said, the one guy the fans get behind when I'm wrestling, get where I do, where they do have sympathy is when I wrestle Vader because he's so much bigger. His yes. stuff looks so good. And, uh, and that's where does, I said, I, I feel like there needs to be an injury. Mickey, we can hear your can. Can we hear his can? A little bit. A little bit? Okay, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> um, and that's where Dusty starts riffing. You know, you'll have, a, you'll have amnesia. We'll, we'll you know, and, he, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. And he goes, we'll take you off the road for three months and we'll pay you. And I'm, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I had confidence that no matter what happened, if we did a strong angle, yes, that it was going to work. But I did feel like there was too much humor from the onset. When Tony said, "Look, we can't go twelve weeks with a serious angle," I said, "Tony, it's a minute or two in a two-hour show. Couldn't you do some humor during those other hour and fifty-eight minutes?" But I guess I was outvoted. And for a while, I wanted to believe that it would work. You know, I went and I did the vignettes. The first vignette they did was without me, where a, 
uh, lost in Cleveland. They had a reporter. Actress did a really nice job of seeming like a correspondent. And But, you know, you had a guy doing a Jack Nicholson imitation. It was a little silly. It was a little silly. I wanted to believe in it, but I did say when Eric Bischoff pulled the plug after like eight weeks, I did say in the book that it was a mercy killing. Because it, and the thing is, Dusty had the right... I, it wasn't that the idea of doing like the, the weekly movies, almost, uh, vignettes almost as motion pictures was wrong. It just wasn't the right moment to do that. What do you think about just amnesia in wrestling in general? A little unbelievable. Yeah. A little unbelievable. And, you know, when they, they went and had an actress portraying my, my wife and kids were crying, I was like, Oh, I don't know if they're going to buy it. In my own defense, I mean, when they pulled it and they let me kind of explain it had all been a head game, I were play, I mean, I made the best out of what I thought chicken was a bad situation. Yeah, the old chicken salad, lemonade. Yes. And when I did come back and made my comeback at Clash of the Champions, I think in September of uh, 93, it was, it was well received. It was also while I was getting ready, I don't know if I was hidden the way the WWE goes to extremes, but uh, I had my own little dressing room, which I, you know, I obviously I never had. That was never part of my deal. But in my dressing room getting <laughs> ready, and I see the a debut of the Shockmaster. And I didn't get it. It took me about 30 seconds to realize that this guy had just <laughs> fallen through a wall. <laughs> One of the all-time great wrestling. The moments. helmet rolls, right? He, trying to get it, it's, <laughs> and he puts the helmet back on. Now comes Oli's voice. Uh, he was trying not to laugh. Uh, trying not to laugh. Everyone around was trying not to yes. laugh. I think you can hear Davy Boy Smith say he blank and fell. Yes. Right on. Uh, and I just broke out laughing. I'd been incredibly nervous, and there I am in my own little dress room, just. Belly laughing at the redemption. It was close to when Mickey caught me in the last twenty seconds of laughing at the stunner that Vince took, which was fantastic. Uh, and but I was laughing even harder before he started filming me. That was the level that I, I've, I was laughing at. So then I had to get back in the zone. Okay, okay, okay. Enough of that. Let me get back in the zone, because I think for anyone, the run-ins are harrowing. I don't care how many times you've done a run-in. Yeah. It's like it's not like a match where there's a slow build or you can make it a slow build. You have introductions. I mean, you have to be right on the money right off the bat. Yes. And no matter how, I could check with, you know, fellow WWE superstars or Al Snow. Right. Either way. <laughs> either way. And I, I think even the most seasoned veteran would tell you their heart rate goes up, yeah. the nerves kick in, even if it's a Royal Rumble. You know, you can't the, build up to right, that adrenaline. You've right. just got to produce it yeah, instantly. You got to have it. Um, talking about the Shockmaster thing, is that your worst case of secondhand embarrassment in wrestling? Like, if secondhand embarrassment exists where you see something happen and you just feel bad for the guy, I mean, here he is on his debut, a guy who's fresh off a pretty good WWE run, his tugboat and typhoon. Right. And now here he is, related to Dusty, who obviously has influence. They've done the walkthrough. They put the board up. It's the big reveal. He's in the main event with Sting and Sid and Bulldog and Harlem Heat. We're on Flair show. It feels like, man, all my dreams have come true. Here I am. Not so much. That, yeah, that was a great example, I think. I think that's the biggest the example, biggest one. maybe. I mean, you could go headhunters who were, you know, these twin 450 pound yes. brothers who do moonsaults. They get to WWE for the tryout. WWE's the only promotion in the country that has ropes instead of cables. They fall off the ropes, boom, done. And I'm in the dressing room going, I've seen these guys, I've worked with them, these guys can work. But sometimes you only get that, you don't One get shot. a second chance to make that first impression. That's why we never heard of the Headhunters in uh, WWE. Yeah, it was, and as you're saying that, I remember this is no knock on, on, on Fred Ottman, but in trying to pick up the pieces, they were doing more on TV for Shockmaster, who they were now calling Uncle Fred. I remember yes. saying to Eric, I was like, Eric, I'm barely even on the show. Like, you're spending more time on the Shockmaster. Then Eric said, hey, here's a guy who fell down on life. We've got to do that. I said, that's fine, do it. 
but what, you know, like I already knew going in, it's not supposed to succeed, right? I'm not saying it's supposed to fail, but it's not supposed to succeed because we've already had the bookings yes. po- you know, in the can that tell you the direction they're going. Uh, and, I, you know, insult on top of injury, uh, Chris Champion was doing a thing as Yoshi Kwan. He was undefeated. And then a week before I read the Yoshi Kwan on TV, he loses to, to Mark Marrow. And the Johnny B. Bad thing was great, but wait two weeks before he gets his first loss. Yes. So that my, and he was one of Harley's guys. Yes. So that my win means something. So I felt like I was, you know, like, I felt like the deck was stacked against me. You were the last kid picked. Uh, Yeah, in a sense, going back to the old gym club. Uh, Do they still do that? I don't know that they do that. That's cruel, man. That is cruel. Between that and having the cut list on the window of the gym office, and you go down there, and brother, when you see you haven't made a team, I went to a big, you know, big uh, high school and a middle school with a lot of students. So it wasn't a case where everyone makes it. You know, for seventh graders trying to make, say, the basketball team, really difficult. They only took a couple. And you go there, and you see you're going through one of the worst moments of your life. Oh yeah, the anxiety at the begin at 7:20 a.m. And now you've got to get somehow get through the next seven hours. Yes. And before you can get on the bus, go, go home, home, fall down on your couch your bed and cry your eyes out yeah those are a couple of, that's one of the most difficult things and being the last kid picked in gym class you're just so much better doing the one two three you know like calling them you set up people against the the wall and they go by numbers you know uh but picking oh, just brutal. let me ask just you about the, the fred ottman thing did you think perhaps he was getting so much time, A, because he was fresh off WWE TV, so they perceived him to be a bigger star because he had come from Vince, or B, his familial relationship with Dustin? No, I think it had to do with him tripping and falling and trying to They were to just trying to overcome pieces. it. Yeah. yeah, and that was a pretty big obstacle to overcome. It, it didn't work. You go from two character. I mean, the big steel man in Florida and then the tugboat had worked Right, I mean, yeah. I mean, you still see Fred Ottman, you know, at uh, he was rubbing up a Hulk Hogan, yeah. man. Um, and now they've got to reinvent him. Uh, they try to reinvent him as a shock master. And now he's got to be like lovable Uncle Fred. Yeah, and I just, I, I, I you know, maybe who knows? Maybe if I went back and looked at it, I'd be like, hey, I'm in plenty of stuff. I got my promo here. I've got an you know enhancement match. Uh, you know it wasn't like I was going in unpushed. I, it's, it just goes back to the idea of knowing that no matter what you do, you, you're not in the. You know, you, you, there's a reason why I had that epiphany that this was both the highest and lowest moment of my career, and when yeah. I hit Leon with the camera, I. Um I got to ask you about Colette because you mentioned that they hired an actress yeah. to play her. And I think you wrote in your book, we don't think your wife ought to be so attractive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they wouldn't let your actual wife yeah. play your wife, not because they wanted to protect her identity uh, or y'all's privacy. Just there's no way Cactus Jack would be married a woman who looks like Colette. Right, right. Isn't that hilarious? It is, looking back on it, right? It's yeah. a little strange. So uh, what would you think of your uh, your TV wife? Well, she did a service. I mean, it made it a, it was supposed to look silly, and it was. Yes. I think my wife would have done a better job. I'm thinking back to the buildup. What what started the, the, the injury angle was Leon powerbombing me on the concrete. Now, he took care of me to a degree that I didn't think he would. But remember, Leon had temporarily paralyzed a a kid named Joe Thurman. Yes. I remember Leon was, I mean, he was bawling backstage, right? Like, he was very upset. He went and visited the young man in the hospital. The guy, thankfully, regained his, you know, every 100%, but he could not move. Scary. It was really scary. And now I'm going to do that match. Uh, I'm going to do that move on the concrete. Yeah, not the ring. And so I, uh, I talked about this like really dark, ominous feeling, like a cloud hanging over me. And before I left the house to go to center stage, I wrote out handwritten last will and testament. Like I really did not know how this was going to go. I get to the building and Dusty tells me like, you don't need to do this. I was like, no, I do. 
like I do. And as I'm talking, there was something that Eric had done that they didn't follow up on, but it was really cool because at the time I had one of my missing front teeth on an earring, which was pretty badass, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And when I was being carried out, there was uh, un hands of unknown origin taking the little pouch I had off the ring post. Uh, and it never went anywhere, but I thought it was cool and indicative of the fact that they really, I mean, at that time, really wanted it to work. Because I was coming back after taking a really bad beating from Leon, legit bad beating, you know, with stitches over the eye and under the eye and the broken nose. And now we're going into the, uh, uh, the match where Leon gives me most of the match or a good portion of it. Probably most offense you'll see in any Foley match under any character, but in the end, I get the power. But I, I pick up the win by count out, which was a big deal at that time. It wasn't seen by the fans as like, oh, it's a count. I mean, these fans were rejoicing. That was yeah. a big deal to beat Leon, you know, beat Leon White, to beat Big Van Vader. And he started throwing the bike racks around like they were toys. And, uh, and that that was when I beat. Wait, well, no, I'm sorry. I, he, I took the beating, but came out with the win. So now we go to the rematch, and Leon gives me most of the most of the match, but uh, ends up power bombing me at the end, which puts me out of action for for weeks. So we shoot these vignettes, and as I understand it, Neil Pruitt gives you an advanced copy, so you can. He take came a look. over to the house. And what did Neil think? Was he excited said, to show it I to was you? excited. No, he was hesitant. I said, what do you think, Neil? Because I want to believe in it. I know they're putting money into these vignettes. And Neil said, there's a little more humor in there than I would like. And I sat there. He came over the house and played it on this machine called a VCR. <laughs> the good old days. <laughs> and, and I was just... Everything I had felt, you know, positive about that angle just kind of, just kind of took the air out of me because it was not the way I wanted it to go at all. It's interesting too because the company and just all of wrestling is in a bit of a transition. Just to add context, in June of '93, that's when Hogan has his sort of swan song with WWE, mm -hmm. loses to Yokozuna. I know he does the European tour after that, but he's going to be finishing up with WWE, and it feels like. The whole industry is changing a little bit in 93. Could you feel that inside of WCW? I mean, did you perceive Hogan finishing up on the other channel? I mean, how did that strike you? Did you think that could be a good opportunity for WCW, or is that a bigger statement about the industry at large? How many months later did the Hulkster come to WCW? It was the next year. Next year. Yeah. 94. So, no, I don't think at that time I realized that it was a true changing of the guard. Because Hulk could get left and come back. He'd Before made, with Warrior he'd made and movies. All that. Yeah, yes. uh, I, yeah. I didn't realize that it was kind of the Bret Hart era uh, beginning, um, which was good for you know. It was good to have a, a great. I mean, one of the great workers of all time, whose calling card is his work, and uh, that was. I think that was really good. Really good for wrestling. A lot of uh, younger. Hopefuls came up being huge Bret Hart fans. Uh, and I think that showed in the quality of wrestling that would follow in the next, you know, next couple decades. You're um, also going to see over the summer, ECW hold the Super Summer Sizzler Tour, where Andy Gilbert is going to uh, go ahead and, and defeat Terry Funk in a Texas chain match uh, to determine who's going to be the king of Philadelphia. This is in the era where Joel Goodhart had been running his tri-state wrestling, mm -hmm. sort of the precursor of extreme championship wrestling. So the, the winds of change are abound in wrestling. You're actually going to also use this time to fix your PCL. And fairly quickly, this whole lost in Cleveland bit yeah. is... When, I, when Dusty laid that scenario out, there was just something inside me that thought, I don't think this is going to work. I kind of saw the plug being pulled months before it was pulled and so i said to dusty since i'm going to be off can i get my posterior cruciate ligament so i'd torn that maybe i mean seven six seven months earlier 
it's the least important of the cruciate ligaments. It's but if not you're off as, TV anyway. Yeah, uh, it's important. But, I, you know, I mean, I'm dealing without one now. So the one they put in with a cadaver uh, tendon ended up tearing in 2004 when I had the reconstruction done uh, after I had to come back and I worked with Randy Orton. Uh, I had a bunch of knee problems, and the guy said, you know, he showed it to me. I was able to see the operation on the, uh, I was uh, anesthetized locally, but I was still very much aware, and I could see them working on the knee, and he showed me, you know, the uh, the cadaver tendon. Even though I tore a ligament, they give a tendon. I don't know why, but the cadaver, and he said, at your, whatever reason, I can't remember the rationale about not replacing that. So it's the least important of the cruciate ligaments, but it was like my ticket, on my, you know, it was my assurance that I would be out the three months that I was told I'd be out because I was having that surgery done. I, um, I think we all agree it didn't work. And one of the things I don't think that gets talked about Certainly we know it didn't work from a humor standpoint. There's nothing funny about right. the way you got this injury right. and you could have told a much more serious story, but maybe because they tried to get too cute, there was some backlash. There were complaints that people felt like you guys were making fun of the mentally ill. And so I didn't even know that Turner started to get some real Ooh. backlash. Ooh, the observer really? says this several complaints were phoned into TBS about the first segment looking for cactus Jack, which aired Saturday. Catherine white was at a mental hospital where they said cactus has been since the Vader match, but he had escaped without authorization. She interviewed a guy pretending to be rain man and a guy pretending to be Jack Nicholson from one flew over the cuckoo's nest. The complaints were largely that that segment made fun of mentally ill people. My complaint is they took an angle that people actually believed and made sure everyone knew it was just another weekly wrestling angle. Yeah. Cactus Jack himself underwent major knee surgery about two weeks back and shouldn't be back in the ring for at least six months, although we all know he'll be back a lot quicker than that. I find it interesting you never heard that there were complaints. No, but I'll also go to the uh, amazing Peter Jackson documentary on the Beatles, Get Back. Did you, did you see it? Yes, it was you great. You know the, the great rooftop concert? Yes. And then there's the young man. I'd like to see what the gentleman looks like now. He's very stoic looking. You know, he's got the little strap. You know, I don't even what they call the, uh, the guys who do the policing yes. there. And he says, we've had complaints, dozens of complaints. And you're thinking, but there's thousands upon thousands of people getting the moment of yes. a lifetime with yes. this. So I, I don't doubt there were complaints, but. Well, the segment sucks. Yes. We segment all, sucks. On that, we all I mean, if I was playing get back on top of the, uh, or I dig a pony on top of the, the building in London, it'd be different. But yeah, we were, it, it was bad. And I guess it was offensive, but I, I'm with Dave there that they took a segment. People really, they took an angle people really believed in that I really could have sunk my teeth into and eventually did and turned it into what Pat Patterson would call ha ha. Uh, I got to ask, we know that dusty got a lot of his great ideas for television and movies. Sure. I mean, even Starcade was a, uh, a game show and then he threw an R in there. I mean, he just, he liked to lean on that. <laughs> This is not too long after the movie Overboard came out with Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. Really fabulous yeah. movie. But the idea, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, is that Kurt Russell is sort of a blue-collar uh, construction worker who's called to make a repair on a yacht, and there's this hoity-toity, really rude, snooty lady Goldie played Hawn. by Goldie Hawn. And she falls off the boat, bumps her head, they find her, and he and convinces Goldie Hawn they're married. Right? Her husband okay. is not anxious to go get her because he's like, oh, I got a free pass now. <laughs> okay. Because this lady now has been saved and rescued, but she has amnesia. Kurt Russell sees this as an opportunity and thinks, I'm going to convince her yeah. she was my wife. It's a, it's a silly movie, but it is a fun movie. Right. And I can't help but wonder, there's a wife involvement here. Someone's got amnesia. I mean, amnesia, when you think about like, stories that's probably the nearest reference that maybe dusty could have saw and i don't think does dusty was watching hallmark christmas movies where there's been like six different amnesia angles going yes. on or general hospital or whatever <laughs> yeah, yeah.
All right, let's run a timeout right now. Of course, my tag team partner here, Dave Silva, and I are going to tell you a little bit about Z-Biotics. I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, I run a tight ship over here uh, in, in podcast land, and I require that I have Dave Silva on top of his game. Now, when I first met Dave Silva, man, it was rough. You know, I knew if we were going to hang out and fellowship the next morning, he wasn't going to be worth nothing. Just a worthless pile of silver. That's what he was. But now, thanks to our friends at Zbiotics, I make sure that I'm getting maximum return on my investment in Dave Silva. You see, I have him start with Zbiotics and then go enjoy a few cocktails, and uh, or as he calls it, cervezas. Either way, here's the deal. I discovered this almost by accident. I remember years ago, Eric Bischoff and I were a podcast movement. We had just gotten Zbiotics as a sponsor pending our approval. So we thought, Hey, well, we'll try it before we have a few drinks tonight. We did. And we were on stage the next morning on top of our game. It's a game changer. I mean, let's just be honest. As we get older, we got to make choices in life. We got to say, we got to quote unquote, grow up, right? Is it worth having a bad tomorrow to have a fun tonight? And more often than not, most of us say, ah, uh-uh. well, now you don't have to make that choice. Zbiotics allows you to enjoy tonight. Drink responsibly, of course, but make sure that we're on top of our game tomorrow morning. I love it. You will too. Let me explain how it works. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. So drink Zbiotics before drinking, drink responsibly, and enjoy the night with confidence. I'm telling you, I'm a true believer in this. You will be too. Savor the moment. Let Zbiotics do the rest. Go right now to zbiotics.com slash Foley to get 15% off your first order when you use the code Foley at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash Foley and use the code Foley at checkout for 15% off. And we thank you Zbiotics for sponsoring today's episode. Um, either way, we do eventually see you, of course, through some of these vignettes, the, uh, correspondent Catherine white would interview a homeless man. There'd be sound effects with gunshots. He would steal her purse and then bring it back. It's a little silly, but finally we see you as a captain of a ship with no facial hair. Your eyebrows are gone. Your memory is gone. Um, and the idea that you're a captain of a ship, again, I come back to, I think my man was watching Overboard with Kurt Russell and Goldie Hunt. Tell us about <laughs> shooting this. You're the captain the of a ship. The mizzenmast, yeah. I, well, first of all, the whole idea of clean shaven, eyebrows shaved. I was trying to think, and I'm not knocking people without homes, and I took umbrage to the guy from Sports Illustrated who said I look decidedly homeless because I'm done a lot of volunteer work with the homeless and they look a lot more like every, you know, the average person on the street than the stereotype of the wild hair and the eyes. You know, they're just people who've fallen behind, yes. can't make ends meet. So I took a little umbrage to that. But I did think, okay, I look like the stereotype of a homeless person to some extent anyway. Like, how do I now portray somebody who's living among the homeless? I was like, shave? Shave it all, right? So clean shaven, eyebrows gone, hair pulled back into a tight ponytail, and uh, doing the best I could to find my inner captain. At one point, Dustin Rhodes is part of this and attempts to help you remember who you are by saying bang, bang. But the homeless people uh, that you keep running into and hanging out with or I was kind of like their leader, wasn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, they were kind of keeping you from finding your real self. And then thankfully, mercifully, Bischoff pulls the plug. <sighs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, and in the buildup, Harley Race receives a mysterious package with a cactus inside. And this is the first time that we've seen cactus in any form finding his way back to the confines of the squared circle. And, you know, the whole gift 
angle before. I mean, we've seen that in various forms. <laughs> yeah. But sending a gift of a cactus, right. I like that. That's pretty decent. The reason I'm laughing is because in order to keep the angle as legit as possible, uh, keeping in mind that we were at center stage every few weeks, yep. and you see a, a lot of regulars there, a lot of people being dropped off by their moms and dads, you know, like... Free, free babysitting because I don't think there was. I don't think you had to pay to get into the center stage. I kept my car in the parking lot at center stage for months, and when I returned, I returned with a bed sheet over me, uh, with a one cutout where I was smoking a cigar as I made my way in, and fans were calling out my name. Yes, right away. <laughs> I believe I have a distinctive walk. <laughs> and uh, it was a surprise to most people, but anyone who saw the mysterious figure with the bed sheet smoking a cigar <laughs> knew that it was me. Have you heard the um, Kerry Von Erich and ECW story no, before? No, no, no. Paul Heyman wanted Kerry Von Erich to show up in the ECW arena as a surprise, so he had him put on a mask. And then Kerry walked to the ring wearing his ring jacket that says Kerry on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be really specific sometimes. Uh, There's a great Terry Funk story that Bronco Lubitsch told me about Terry coming into uh, Dallas. I think where it may have been Carolinas because Bronco had a nice. Bronco is a long running uh, referee, senior referee, and world class. And a lot of times, if he didn't feel like he getting down for a count, he'd just tell you to kick out <laughs> or he out with his foot. Bronk wasn't real big on the heels of getting heat because that was his job, but he told these marvelous stories. And I think Stone Cold Steve Austin would vouch for me. Bronco was a wonderful man. And he told this story about Terry coming in. Maybe it was Florida. Maybe it was Carolinas with a mask as the Texan. And uh, somebody wanted an autograph and Bronco said, Hey, Terry oh, oh, caught himself. And then Terry pulled him aside and said, come on, brother Bronco, this is business. We got to protect the business. And then uh, a few minutes later, a guy comes up to Bronco and says, I know that the Texan is Terry Funk. And Bronco thinks, oh, my goodness, I've ruined it. He goes, why do you say that? He goes, he signed his name, Terry oh, Funk. Oh, my God. <laughs> How great is that? Oh, that's so good. So, listen, you make your return, Clash of the Champions, August 18th, 1993. Right at the end of the show, you're going to be brawling with Vader following his win over Davey Boy Smith, where he retained the WCW title. And now you're back on track, man. You're going to have a sit down with Tony and cut promos about how you're back and how you're ready to gain revenge on Vader. I mean, listen, this is almost like a hard reset after the loss mm -hmm. in Cleveland mm -hmm. vignettes. Uh, and, but really one of the first times you've done like the sit down interview. So before you did it with Jr. in 97, here you are doing it with Tony in 93. What do you remember about this? Nothing. Okay. There we go. I, I, I remember that I, it went pretty well. Yes. I think it went well. Uh, of course, everybody wants to know, well, that means you're definitely on the next pay-per-view against Vader, right? Nope. We're doing fall brawl with uh, the war games match. You referenced it earlier. That's the shock master. So as a reminder, we've got Dustin Rhodes and Davey boy and sting and shock master there to take on uh, Sid and Vader and the Harlem heat. And you're going to be in there against Yoshi Kwan. Uh, and, and your match against Yoshi is for possession of what Harley race took from you, the bag. And we've talked a little bit about Chris champion and the fact that the timing of this match, right? Maybe and it, it, as better. you say it now, it's like, why didn't we give them? First of all, you know. Why weren't you just on the other? Uh, like, screw the shock master. You're the mystery guy. You're here for revenge on Vader. Could have been you. They want to make you a baby face. What better way to make you the number two baby face than tagging with, I don't know, the number one baby face. It's right there. You should have come through that wall. Thank you. I should. <laughs> And, and here's the, here, I mean, I guess it could have been worse. You could have had a stormtrooper helmet covered in glitter. <laughs> you know, you were disappointed to have to wear a mask in the WWE. Can you imagine wearing a stormtrooper mask covered in glitter? <laughs> With wow. the glitter, right? Oh, man. Yeah. That... It was right there that you should have been that tag team partner. That should have been your spot. That sound that way. Yeah. And I don't recall pitching that. Yeah. Um, I get they wanted to debut a guy, but if you really want to shock Vader, 
Here it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, here it is. And yeah. and also by that time, Shockmaster was lovable Uncle Fred. Yeah. Look, I hear things turned out pretty good for me, so I don't want to seem like, uh, <laughs> like I'm bitter. Um, but looking back on it, yeah, clearly there were things that could have been done that weren't done. One hundred percent. So before your match at Fall Brawl, uh, Meltzer would say the low light of this was the pre-match video that did a news piece type video narrated by Chris Cruz. And before the piece, Shivani talked about how Cactus lost his memory, disappeared, didn't even recognize his family, etc. Basically, basically everything that an interview done on television two weeks ago had acknowledged mm-hmm. wasn't the case. Yeah. So now we've got two different sets of storylines and nobody informs the announcers that an angle was dropped, even when it's dropped on their show. Then the video had Chris talking about all the ridiculous videos, going to Cleveland, not recognizing his family, finishing with them, showing cactus, doing an interview saying it wasn't his wife and kids. And now you've got two announcers in a row who just said it was. Oh, man, I remember Kevin Sullivan telling me in 1990, I had a suggestion, and I think it was involving a camera angle with Kevin doing the uh, the backbreaker yep. into the elbow. Brother, if they get 50% of things right here, consider yourself fortunate. So uh, I wanted to believe in the angle. You know, I felt like they were over that 50%. Yeah. Um, they had invested time, effort, energy, yeah, money. Yeah, they, they, inv- they invested, yeah, all those things. I go back to the idea that I could tell it wasn't supposed to be a success based on how the booking went from that point on. Yeah. And I just think, imagine they, they'd done that with Steve Austin. Yeah. And they said, well, his run is ending after the strap match with Savio. And then, you know, you take something. I'm not, I'm not trying to compare my run in right, WCW, right, right. but the idea that there should be a way to take something that's working and run with it and grow with it. Yeah. yeah. So you've got this pre tape promo. Meltzer would say you're standing in a dirty alley with smashing pumpkin posters yeah, behind yeah, you. Sure was. And Jack admits that he faked losing his memory. And he said he wasn't, wasn't really his wife and family on TV. He tries to say it was mind games against Harley race and Vader. And he says they believed it because they wanted to. And he lists the trophies that Vader has collected like stings ribs Ron Simmons' shoulder, Joe Thurman's back, and Nikita Koloff's neck. And then Jack refers to himself as a Saskatchewan moose and says Vader wants his head, but he can't have it. Jack says that being on the shelf gave him time for him to gather his thoughts and to brew like a bag of tea in a sea of hatred. (laughs) But it's not sipping tea, it's brutality. Brutality, woo. He says if you can arrest a man for his thoughts, then they should hang him there. He finishes by saying his time and day as Cactus Jack is worse than any ghoul, specter, or ghost. So you're back on track. And I remember delivering that one pretty well. Like I was I was in the zone for a series of interviews. Where'd y'all shoot that? Do you recall? It was uh, in downtown Atlanta. I just thought Smashing Pumpkins was an allusion to something taking place around Halloween. There you go. I didn't realize. Really? <laughs> you, Not you, only that, he would be one of the biggest stars in... Yeah, huge rock star. Huge, but also own a wrestling company. Yeah. Uh, but that was just me thinking it was a halloween place to cut a promo. I like it. Speaking of halloween a guy who came trick-or-treating is Yoshi Kwan, lost in three minutes and 38 seconds to a double-arm DDT. Um, yeah. It's a little weird to see that, you know, his winning streak comes to an end yeah. before the pay-per-view. Before the pay-per-view, right. Either way, you beat him and you move on. The creative is lacking a little bit. You're writing in your book that you're only given one live interview to build up to your match with Vader. Meanwhile, Dusty's given himself a bunch of air time. <laughs> no, was I being tough on Dusty? You were being tough on oh, Dusty. But I love I, Dusty. But I think, you know, in that era, that's really the way you felt. Well, this was also the, um, even before Watts came in, there was a lot of, pressure on the powers that be to build up the Omni into the Madison Square Garden of the South. So that Dusty may have been talking specifically about a guest referee spot he was doing. I was always bewildered at the idea that we had national, I believe it was international TV, and yet we would spend so much more time. And this wasn't a Dusty thing. This was a 
TBS Turner edict. Like we are going to build up this venue that's no longer even there right. to be the MSG of the South. So I don't want to be, I, and you could tell by the way I talk about Dusty, right? Dusty gave me a huge break. Yes. I mean, when you're sitting, there was, remember, this is the first memoir outside of Adrian Street who wrote his own memoir where the guy is actually doing the right yes. of me and me. And, I mean, there's a lot of solitary late nights. There's playing. I was writing wherever uh, I happen to be, but you're reliving these. Th I do it, you know, when I talk about writing, I go like, I don't never go like this, you know. I, I was always writing. It was almost like I was hunched over. And I'm reliving these moments, and there was some frustration coming through. Yes. Um, but, man, I, I was a little tough on the dream. Uh, sorry. So well, that's okay. Love the guy. I do want to ask you about your visit with Eric because you start to get a little nervous when you see the booking sheets and you realize that it doesn't feel like you're figured in. And you referenced what was happening at the MGM mm -hmm. shows and you know you're not on those, not the way that you imagined you would be. And so as I understand it, you have a sit down with Eric where you would write in your book that you came up with like a really professionally printed, almost thesis Boy, wise. With, about 20 with charts pages and graphs yeah, and charts and graphs. And at that point, ratings were the be all and end all. We didn't have 15 minute breakdowns, but I was the closest I could come to proving that I could draw was by showing the Sunday night main event ratings over the course of the six weeks that I did my angle with Vader and how they'd continued to grow. Because I remember going up there, you, you, I don't think they sent the check to you. I think you had to go get your check at CNN Center. And I went up there, and I've talked about this before in different contexts, about there was a sign that says, w, well, home of the, whatever the rating, the rating was. was. It was a big rating for uh, the awesome, the, con, the Harley's Kong guys, yes. you know. Yes. Uh, they did a one-time big rating. So they, the ratings were the deal for WCW. And I, I printed it up and I sent it to everybody I could think that had some clout. And uh, I, again, when I was writing about the idea that, wow, I'm I, I, low, low six figures, I'm still gonna, I'm thinking I'm gonna jump from 156 to 250. Right. You know, I don't think I'm going to get the 400 like I think Rude did. I'm not going to get that, but I, two, I'm, I've got my eyes set on 250 after three years of hard work, or almost three. So do you schedule an appointment with Eric's office and then bring yeah, so him this a would copy? Have been over, yeah, bring the, copy? Uh, I think I sent them out. Okay. I think I sent, I can't remember exactly. Um, and uh, so it had been two years at that point, but the contract was coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, uh, it rolled, so yeah, the contract would be coming up September, October, because it came up every year. It wasn't like a WC, WWE three-year deal. It was renewable every year. And I thought that, you know, going into this thing, I've got a reasonable shot to pick up a raise. And then when I see where it's going, I was like, man, even before Bill Watts came in and, you know, did his best to put the kibosh on a lot of salaries. The fact that I stayed at 156, yeah, man, a, yes. he loved me, right? Yeah, so I saw that stuff kind of uh, some of my dreams and hopes going by the wayside. You wrote that Eric tells you there's no money for you. Are you guys face-to-face? -face? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think I'm in his office. Um, and he just says something like it's not in the budget? I think so. And, and just to add context, you're in the middle of this big angle with Vader, you're about to headline what he thinks is their biggest pay-per-view of the year. They've invested all of this money, a substantial sum. And I know that that gets lost sometimes, but if you factored in the production costs of all of these vignettes, had they simply not done them and just given that money to you, you would have had more than what you were asking for. And I really think uh, injury, comeback, Fiery promos, yes, money, yes. Um, I said to you know during the build up one of the manias where it was clear when Brian uh, invited Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan. I can't remember the exact matchup, but back when I was more frequently critical of the product, maybe because I was watching much more intensely, I said sometimes you just want a great steak. 
you don't need all the you you don't need all the sauces and accompaniments. It's like we had a great steak. But like I said, angle, comeback, promos, match, and it was <laughs> you know we got Bernays sauce on there. I'm overdoing the the. the I just find it fascinating <laughs> to me that they're telling you it's not in the budget. This is the same era where they're spending all this money on these mini movies that Sidello was putting together. Yeah, yeah. And now all of these vignettes, like if they, and, and, and they admit it wasn't working. Right. And they ask you to get them back on track and you do. But now when you ask for a raise, seemingly roughly a hundred grand, which is less than they just spent or more than what they yeah. just spent. You know what I mean? Like, well, here's what I said. And I've mentioned this in my live shows is that, they worked themselves into a situation where you couldn't be a top guy unless you made top guy money. You couldn't make, but you couldn't make top guy money unless you were top guy. So they had their handful of people who were their main events and they pretty much had to go with them. Yes. And so I got that little two, three month period there where it looked like I might be a main event guy, but no one was ever going to give me main event money there, nor were they going to give it to Steve Austin or Dustin Rhodes. So I wasn't by or uh, Pillman, right? Or uh, well, no, Pillman did end up getting the, the the big raise, but that was also a few years later. But I just I knew I wasn't factored in because you show someone what they mean to the company by what you pay them. All right, let's take a time out right now. Of course, I got my tag team partner here, Dave Silva, with me, and we're going to be talking about something that we're both a big fan of, being in a better mood. Yeah, buddy. If you're looking some, looking for something to help you chill and relax, you're looking for something to help you sleep a little bit easier, maybe you're looking to just calm down. Maybe you're looking to relieve some soreness. Mood can help. Mood is known for their federally legal THC, but now they're adding the most potent product yet to the lineup, introducing hemp-based THCA flower, the future of legal THC. Try it along with all of Mood's other amazing offerings like Delta 8 flower, gummies, vape cartridges, and more. And for a limited time, Mood is giving our listeners a free gram of THCA flower and 20% off your first order. Just visit hellomood.com and use our code Foley. And I got to tell you, I'm so impressed with this product. Uh, I was able to, uh, to try this one. I wasn't really sure. There's a lot of this that I'm still learning about and getting more familiar with. But let me just tell you, the gummy, high five. You see, I, I'll be honest. There's this big breakthrough that I didn't even know about. And Mood has brought it to us. THCA flower. You see, THCA converts into THC when you heat it. So you get that classic, I don't know, for lack of a better word, feeling. And Mood has 10 high inducing strains, the most potent they've ever offered. Mood puts an end to guessing games with federally legal forms of THC that have been extracted from hemp plants. How about that? All of their products are regularly third-party tested with the Drug Enforcement Agency registered labs, and they've been sourced from small family farms and then grown organically. And the experts at Mood have tested and tailored different strains for specific moods from euphoric to energized to creative to chill. And there's plenty of versatile products to go with whatever mood you're looking for. However you enjoy taking THC, man, Mood has you covered. It's great for both beginners like myself and veteran users like our friend, good old JR. They've got great taste in gummies, as for me. They've got classic flour, convenient pre-rolls, and so much more. Try Mood's new THCA flour today. And for 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flour, go to hellomood.com and use the code FOLEY. That's hellomood.com and the promo code Foley gets you 20% off your order and a free gram of THCA flour. Well, so when he says we don't have it in the budget for you, you make a call to JJ Dillon and the WWF. It was and, a brief call. Well, I want to talk about that. <laughs> like a, what was said, were you just sending out a feeler? Were you, were you doing it because your feelings were hurt? No, I, I called every year when my contract was about to uh, 
be up for renewal or termination just to test the waters. And uh, every year for three years, I'd be dismissed in less than a minute. Now, that wasn't JJ's doing. You know, I didn't know at the time that Vince McMahon said, Cactus Jack will never step foot in a WWE ring. I didn't know that he thought I looked seedy and didn't look like a star. You know, I thought I was being dismissed out of hand, like at JJ said, we're not looking for talent. And then I would go on, I would watch Raw and I'd see like Mantar, the debut. I was like, don't they know that I know they're lying to me? Just so you're not WWE material. I mean, I, I looking back at them, I'm, I'm glad because I love, I love proving, loved it, proving yes. people wrong. Going back to what the independent guy should do, or the guy should do when they're released. Prove Vince wrong. I know he's. I don't know how much he's in the mix anymore. But at least when I was there, he he liked it when people could prove it would prove him wrong. He liked when people took a challenge head on. We know that the JJ is the head of talent relations at the time. Yeah. But we also know that Jim Ross is there at this yeah. point. Uh, he's just, he's quote unquote just an announcer. He's not yet taken over the talent relations role. But did it cross your mind to call Jr. Because you knew he was an advocate. For I may have. You know, okay. I can't remember. Okay. I may have. Um, but like I said, those three, I only called once a year and they were, sorry about that, they were brief calls, brother, less than a minute. While you were in your meeting with Bischoff, he would go down the roster checking off names uh, of folks who made more or less than you. And you wrote specifically about Jesse Ventura. Um, you wrote, it was no use. Bischoff wasn't going to budge. I really had no other recourse. I had a family to think of and a child on the way in two months. And to make matters more difficult, Colette was dilating early and was forced to spend the last 10 weeks of her pregnancy in bed. I explained the situation to Bischoff and then said in a voice that was pretty near cracking with emotion, if I can take the same money, can I have the next six weeks off to, sp uh, to spend helping my wife? Now, this is where we already discussed how misleading a title on an internet article was. And I said, the thing about it is the article was accurate, but the title made it sound like Eric Bischoff wouldn't allow me to go home for the birth of my child, which was 100% not real. It was, was not, that even not remotely accurate. There was never a time when I said, Eric, my wife's about to give birth, like, can I have the death? No, that never happened. It was the six weeks where he said, Cactus, you were just off for, you know. Four months. Yeah, four months. And I said, Eric, you've seen where I'm booked. You know, I was booked on the B shows. I think for that, at that time. You even was, plead with him in the book. You write, Eric, you've got me teaming up with Ice Train in junior high schools in the backwoods of the Carolinas. How important could that match be? And he asked, if I get you the time off where you sign for 156, yes, I will. I left the CNN center that afternoon vowing that I would never let myself be put in that position again. And I didn't, but I did. I mean, that's, I mean, you know, back when they used to give magazine, remember when you go on an airplane and they'd have like the Delta magazine, yes. they don't do that anymore since no. COVID. Uh, but it would say in life, you don't get what you're worth. You get what you negotiate. Yes. And here, I mean, now I have Barry Bloom. Yeah. Barry Bloom's my bad guy. Right? And I mean, a hell of a bad guy. A hell of a The bad Darth guy. Vader of wrestling <laughs> contracts. So I don't have to worry about, no. you know, the reason I went <laughs> the reason I went back to WWE in 2005, yeah, uh, is that I was, I, I was not allowed, because I know we're jumping around subjects here. Um, so Barry Bloom was the, I met Barry Bloom through Jesse Ventura when Jesse said, hey, this is my manager, Barry Bloom. And for a while, it was really looked down upon, considered almost freakish to have somebody negotiating for you. But I was up there, I'd actually brought a little briefcase, and here I am, you know, uh, pitching to the head of a multi-million dollar company why I think I deserve a little more. Uh, the game would change dramatically, you know, with really Barry was the guy that broke open the door for for agents and, uh, you know, both WWE and AEW, they realize that they go through agents now and that's a way to not, you know, you know, there are some bad feelings involved when money is involved, you know. I mean, it's funny that we're talking about the difference between 150 and 250 for a company that worked 200 days, you know. Yes. And now, you know, you're looking at 
you could see like a one dimensional jump shooter pulling down 44 million yes. to be able to shoot the ball. Yeah. And we're talking about the difference between 150 and 250. Even if it was 30 years ago, it's. Yeah, there are wrestlers you know, who work less than one day a week and make seven million a year now. Yes. Uh, yeah. And remember, out of that 150, you've got to pay, you, they took care of your flights, you got to pay your hotel. You have to pay your meals. You have to pay your rental car. And your taxes. And your taxes. And so you're not looking at... A ton of money. You're not looking at a ton of money. You know, I had a friend who uh, worked on the Long Island Railroad. His hand, and next, Kings Park, next stop, Kings Park. He was, after all was said and done, making more than I was as a global superstar on borrowed time. Because keep in mind, at that time... You know, you were getting the elbow every night, you know, whether it was a televised show or a house show. I was going all out every night. And this, you know, jumping forward to when I won the title uh, against uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He's not, this is his energy drink, still pitching for him. Um, and then, you know, you know, we discussed the Shivani, yeah. uh, you know. What hurt me so badly about that was that I'd worked so hard for them for yeah. three years. And even though I'm complaining a little bit about the push, I was not a squeaky wheel there. I really wasn't. I was really easy to work with. Um, that's kind I, of a I, curse at times. Uh, huh? Yeah. I mean, there was, after I lost a year, that's when I started to get upset. That's when I realized uh, there's nothing I can do that is going to give me a future in this company. So I did become argumentative, maybe difficult to deal with after that, but that was uh, you know, it was two and a half years into a three year run where I realized, you know, there I'm reading the writing on the wall and it's not easy to read. It's not difficult to read. The final interview on Saturday night before Halloween Havoc. So it's the night before it's a tape show, but you did a promo and of course, as a reminder, this is spin the wheel, make the deal. Yeah, yeah, That's sort yeah, of the concept. Yeah. And Dave Meltzer would say Cactus Jack comes out for an interview about his match with the WCW world champion Vader at Halloween Havoc at the end of the show. Cactus says he doesn't see the most brutal matches in history when he looks at the wheel. Instead, he sees his friends. He has some barbed wire with him and tells a story about when he was seven years old, when he had some hard labor in upstate New York. He went there with his bicycle that didn't have brakes and he called out for his mommy and daddy while getting stuck in the barbed wire. He went home and got his wounds cleaned out. Cactus realized that he liked it. He got more barbed wire and put it under his pillow, allowing him to sleep like a baby. And Cactus confronts Harley race as he comes out to interrupt the interview. Cactus tells Harley that he's in for the longest night of his life. Harley goes to spin the wheel and is instead met with a double arm DDT from Cactus. Cactus goes to the wheel and spins it. They do some slow motion and say, to be continued at Halloween Havoc tomorrow night. Yeah. What did you think about this, man? Getting the DDT Harley race. Well, Harley was, oh, Harley was, he was, Harley was the best. Yeah. He really was. And I remember, you know, writing, um, I think it was when I signed my book for him. I said, I wish, uh, no, I think it was when I left WCW and said, I wish, Someone else, you know, just thanked him for everything I'd done. I can't remember said if only the had done as much for me as you did. Is Harley? Yeah, you know, Harley was in the. You know, he's one of the great workers of all time. Legendary tough guy, and he called me up after that power bomb. You know, and I'm supposed to be staying awake. I don't think that's the medical science now, but at least at that time it that's was. That's what was the common. Thought. You stayed awake. You weren't supposed to fall asleep. And Harley calls me up. You know, trying to keep me up and. And I said, do you think it went well, Harley? He goes, Cactus, uh, they couldn't have done it better if we'd done it a hundred times. And I said, thank you, Harley. He goes, kid, you are the new Harley race. And that's the biggest compliment. What a compliment. What a compliment, right? Spin the wheel. What did you think of that concept? I loved it. I mean, I, look, you know, we're talking about the money they threw around. Uh, so was it nine, uh, one year earlier when it was uh, Sting and Jake? Yes. And that's when they did, I think, their first mini movie. And Jake, you know, I think Meltzer even said, like, Jake Roberts should be in Hollywood, right? Yes. You know, to this day, Sam Elliott's looking for his mustache back. Yes. <laughs> did Sam Elliott pass away? I don't think so. 
Not you want to do a quick Google search? Okay. I, well, I can't because I don't know what the Wi-Fi is. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Grillo, are you on the case? Sam Elliott's still alive? He's definitely still alive. Because, yeah. okay. Yeah, he's still alive. So Jim, just, Jim, I think you might be mix up William Hurt because they both played General Ross. In Hulk Remember? movies. Yeah, in the mm. Hulk 2003, Sam Elliott. Was, so here's a little, then, East, a little Easter egg in, sorry to cut you off, buddy. A little Easter egg in uh, Peanut Butter Falcon. As I'm doing the announcement and Jake Roberts playing Samson, uh, they cut to uh, 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 Lance Archer. No, no, not Lance Archer. They, uh, Shia LaBeouf yes. and uh, Dakota Johnson. Yes, but you can still, but you can still hear the announcer in the background. So if you watch, if you watch the Peanut Butter Falcon. Listen real closely when they cut from the ring announcer to Dakota Johnson and Shia LaBeouf, and you can hear me saying, I talked to Sam Elliott, he told me he wants you to give him his mustache back. Oh, that's <laughs> Just great. trying to pop Jake. Yes. You know, just trying to get a, you know, he's got a cigarette, he's ashes about this long, he's yes. just doing a dynamite job as this character. Um... And at this point, I've completely forgotten about it. No, we were just talking about spin the wheel and throw the money around. So, yeah, they put the, uh, Jake did a great job. And then of all the matches they could do, they come up with coal miners. Terrible, terrible. Which means nothing to anyone who's not actively in the coal mining business. Like, yeah, that worked in some of the Watts towns in West Virginia, Pennsylvania. But if you weren't near a coal mine, it meant no. You had all these things. Texas death match. I don't know what they had, but it was like, Ten great matches, and then... This one. Yeah, so we get Texas Deathmatch, and I'm thrilled with it. I liked it. I mean, I think... But you said we get. Are you implying that it was a real spin? If I am implying that, I am deceiving you with that... (laughs) <laughs> okay, because you said, and we and get, God. like, all the luck of the draw, man. I don't know how they, I, I don't know how it, I don't know how they do it. Magnets or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I had a pretty good idea. <laughs> pretty good idea. I would have been cool with any number of those matches, but the coal, coal miner glove was just the worst choice. I don't see how two uh, learned people, uh, not not to be confused with House of Learned Doctors from stepbrothers I, I i love that you <laughs> that's actually our what don't tell people that no it's not password oh no, okay our wi-fi is house it's of learning like SSID. id that's the name it used to be something else and then i came back home in new hampshire and it said house of learn doctors connected i'm like what do you know your dad's pin number <laughs> Could you just say it in the microphone? Right now, that'd be good. I can hardly well, remember my it. My kids know my PIN number, so they're no secret. I kind of forgot about it. He though. Forgot. He I entered it, it in earlier today when you told me, but yeah. he remembers it better than me. Yeah. Don't really say it. I was just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't. Well, by now, you know this episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex, shall we? Remember the days when you're always ready to go? Well, now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up. It's bluechew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. Take these anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And the process is simple, y'all. You just sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part, man, it's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. Dude love would be proud. Seriously, this is a home run. They're a day one sponsor for us here on the program. And you know why it really works. If you haven't tried it already, what are you waiting for? And how about this? we got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Foley at checkout. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the day's podcast. You've heard Mick talk about it for years. AG1, Mick and I absolutely love AG1. We start each and every day with a simple scoop. That's it. That's all we need. One single scoop and a cup of water. And buddy, we're getting 75 different high quality ingredients 
It's going to hook you up and give you all the key daily nutrients. And it's going to go ahead and support everything you need, your energy, your focus, your strength, your clarity. This is just a, a no brainer to me. Think of it as like your foundational nutrition product. You know, listen, we all get busy and we wind up, well, I didn't want to do this for lunch, but I don't feel like I have an option or, well, I know I need to Dude, this is easy. Just one scoop every single day. You're making sure you're taking care of your most valuable asset. You, you cover all your bases. You're looking for better gut health. You want to boost in energy. You want to support that immune system. Maybe you hate taking pills or vitamins. Maybe you just want a supplement that tastes good. I drink mine every single morning. My wife does hers before she even does her coffee. It makes her feel unstoppable on her way to the gym. And I think it gives me more focus at work. I feel like I'm more productive and I don't have that crash in the afternoon. I feel like I'm more productive all day long. We started this back even before the pandemic started, my wife did, but when the pandemic started, man, she had me start doing it. We've done it every day since we are huge fans. I think you will be too. Even our daughters are into it now. Morgan's actually taking some down to Tuscaloosa with her. With every single serving, you're setting yourself up for success. I just can't recommend it enough. By the way, you don't have to take our word for this. Just go look up their reviews. These cats have thousands of five-star reviews. It's the real deal. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG one travel packs with your first purchase. Go right now to drink ag1.com slash Foley. That's drink ag1.com slash Foley. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. <laughs> gonna, gonna say, I don't need your dad texting me later. <laughs> what was it again? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so listen, you, you, you don't have to do this, this promo about spin the wheel live. This is a tape show. And so you write in your book that you had a match in Phoenix on Friday night and you have to drive. And I guess there was an issue with your convertible. What's the story with that? Oh yeah. Yeah. I no, I didn't know it was in Phoenix. I thought the issue was when I flew to new Orleans one day ahead of time, I had a 84 Chrysler, the Baron that occasionally had troubles with the uh, convertible top. Oh, and I, I couldn't get it to, I couldn't get it to connect. I couldn't get it to lock down, and it was raining. And but I thought, ah, you know what? Like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be going 60 miles per hour. The rain's gonna just, you know, I'll be okay to drive to the airport. It's about a 45 minute drive, but it was a torrential downpour. I mean, I arrived. So in, you drove in the rain in a torrential downpour in a convertible. Rain. And I was chilled to the bone. You know, it's even though it's Georgia, it's late October. It's 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 not Saskatchewan, right? It's uh, not New England, but still, man. I, you know, with the breeze, with the and breeze, the, the rain, and the water, oh, man. So when I by the time I got to New Orleans, the day before, I was I was in rough shape. Oh man, rough. Was the shape. car ruined? Ah, no. It was it was ten years. It was nine years old. Um, it wasn't, uh, I mean, it, there was a little damage, but uh, I was. You uh, kept driving it. Yeah, yeah, I kept driving it for another Who am I talking years. to? Of course yeah. you kept driving it. Yeah. Uh, so listen, let's talk about the match. Meltzer had a lot of strong opinions about it coming out of it. And he said, event. the Cactus Jack Vader main event exemplified what is beginning to turn into a dangerous trend in this business. Not disturbing to fans because many love matches such as this. It's disturbing because the element of risk and injury is being flirted with too closely when matches as stiff and legitimately brutal as this and other recent matches have turned out to be. I was actually planning on writing this before the Havoc show with the main emphasis being on the plight of the All Japan Women's Promotion in 1993 and the daredevil tactics of Sabu but Vader and Jack put on a match that was one of the best of the year and in many ways defines the problem. Now you've heard this criticism for a long time and certainly fans online say it today about some of the more daredevil type stunts like we may see from a Darby Allen. Yeah. It was a pretty controversial moment. I'm sure you saw a couple of pay-per-views ago from AEW where Christian threw him onto the stairs from the ring apron onto the floor. It was pretty brutal looking. And a lot of fans, you know, have an opinion about that. I sort of say, Hey, let's leave it to the professionals. 
But when you would read this from someone whose opinion at the time you greatly valued, like Dave Meltzer, did you think in the course of this match you were pushing it too far? With the exception of the one planned injury spot that didn't work out. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, Otherwise. I don't know. I mean, you know, um, some of the guys who were really highly regarded from the glory days of all Japan uh, are struggling I mean, uh, Masao was killed, killed in the ring. Killed in the ring. Uh, they work this strong style, which means you bring it with the forearms. And you get dropped uh, on your head. You get dropped in your head. We would lead on. I mean, it wasn't just snug. It was it was stiff, real stiff. And when Leon opened up my eyebrow, like, oh, man, that's some impress. It just looks different. It's yes. got a different feel to it. It was like a dark red. And it was really dramatic. You can't have those matches every night. No. Uh, but for a blow-off, hey, I would do 100 of those before I would do take a few of those ladder bumps that people do in Money in the Bank. Because I look at those, and anytime I say, oh, I hate to see people do it, they go, hey, what about this and this? I go, there are some moments there where I go, God, to this day, uh, I'm grateful to the... I mean, grateful that, grateful to God that Sasha Banks is still walking because she took a bump going crossways, yes. not with it. And I just, oh my God, you know, like there are, there, there, people want to point out things I did and say that was much more dangerous than that. They can. I'm just telling you, somebody who knows the anatomy and what, you know, the limits we can I, you push the limits yeah, further yeah, push than the most. Limits. I see certain things that I'm not comfortable with that I don't think are safe. And other than the move that was in there specifically to end my career and did not. You felt good about it. I felt good about it. I, I was okay. I mean, there were house shows like the one in Manchester, UK, where everything, we brought it all out. But it wasn't like Leon was breaking my nose every night or splitting my eyebrow eyebrow every night you know i mean there's a time and a place and i thought that was the time and a place i think i think dave's got a legitimate look I, there's a reason why i had to leave wrestling full-time really? at the peak of my earning yes. you know if i'd been a little wiser if i'd thought to add one more move to my repertoire which would have been boom block the chair right easy you know I struggle walking largely because of that one move, the elbow on the concrete. You know, there are other things, knee injuries that come along, but as, as far as just really shaking up my skeletal structure, you know, that elbow was the worst thing I could possibly Because you did it so consistently? Inconsistently, and I was 300 pounds. Like Hogan it. with the leg drop, really. Yeah, you think to yourself, well, that doesn't even look like much, but you're like, here's a 300-pound man coming down night after night with one leg slightly above the other, so you're jarring your vertebrae. Oh, on wood and steel. I mean, I remember talking with Hulk where he was four inches taller than me, and now when I talk to Hulk, he's about the same height as me, and that's after I've shrunk a couple inches. Yeah. So that wreaked havoc on the Hulkster's body. So, And nobody would have thought, oh, that's too extreme. It's at a leg time. drop. It's a leg drop. So, I mean, I think people could have looked at that. I don't think any, whereas all the veterans, kid, you know, you're going to be in a wheelchair, kid, you know, you're going to do it. They were all right. Not about the wheelchair, but it was every bit as bad for my body as a lot of the veterans said. I don't think anybody was pulling Hulk aside saying, this is going to mess up your entire life because you're dropping a leg. But you don't know where the, sometimes you don't know where the true injuries are coming from. I'm just saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with my idea statement that ladder matches especially the really dangerous things are worse than anything i did other than the one move that was designed to end my career intentionally and maybe getting thrown through the hell in a cell yeah I, I'm, but i'm speaking specifically about that match sure, 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 yeah sure. Uh, so Melser would say, there's going to be a can you top this mentality to pro wrestling. Younger wrestlers are constantly learning from and imitating those who have stretched the boundaries of their imagination when it comes to brutality and acrobatics. And because of that, despite the cries that this isn't so from old timers, the actual in-ring product 
constantly evolves and constantly improves unless it's stifled by those who can't bear to let go of the past. But with improvements, if the new ways continue either stiffer or more realistically brutal blows, easy for me to say, as in Japan, uh, as in Mexico with the higher risk acrobatics, it comes with an increase in the dangers. And at what point do the risks exceed the potential rewards? And you had that down to a science and remind everybody about your the fully instantaneous risk reward ratio analysis. I love that. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the match itself. It goes 15 minutes and 59 seconds using the old school death style match where it is, of course, the Texas death match. But the deal here is falls don't count, and if it continues until one man can't answer the bell after a 30-second rest period, um, when you're going into this match, what are you, besides trying to accidentally end it early, <laughs> is there something else you're so trying to accomplish? Should we address why I wanted to end my career in Let's that match? It. Because of all the reasons I talked about. Uh, get to the promised land and it's not, there's no end game. There's no benefit to having gotten there that my, you know, there is no pay raise. Yes. There is no pay main event in my future. And at that point, you know, I am, I am beaten up. I am beat. I, you know, I was trying to think I was referencing, oh, going back, I had a discussion with, uh, Huey, my son about basketball and the uh, NBA finals with the Celtics and oh no no NBA Eastern finals Celtics and uh Heat and uh the Celtics were shooting like 20% from 3 and the Celtics coach was asked given that uh you know no threes weren't dropping is there anything you do differently he said no and so I'm thinking I don't know if I expressed it to you I'm like I remember but I the idea was in my mind I'm in Savannah, Georgia with Sting doing a Falls Count Anywhere match. It's where Dusty said, we're going to make you the, fall, the king of the Falls Count Anywhere match, which means I never won them, but I was always advertised as the king of the Falls Count Anywhere match. I think I'm going to get away with doing some funny stuff because you can do some funny things in the Falls Count oh, Triple H, mm -hmm. Beal to I me mean, Beal tossing, me throwing uh, – Triple H with a pair of salad tongs by the nose. You know, you can get away with some funny stuff. But as I, I, I get a plunger and Sting use, you know, hey, let's do this, Sting, this will be fun. Never called him Steve up until like 2010. He got the plunger on me and I'm just not getting the feeling that the funny, they're buying the funny stuff. So we have to regroup, do a much more serious, hard-hitting match. I remember Colette was on the road with me. I think this is a... Maybe Dewey's either a baby or she's very pregnant with Dewey. And I'm literally crawling down the hall on my hands and knees to get to my room because I'm banged up that badly. And I'm thinking, if I can change the game plan during a house show in Savannah, right. certainly you can change the game plan when it's not working. So, so I'm just saying you could change things up um, I don't know how this relates to what I was talking about, the frustration I felt, but I, I did have a, I did have other gears I could go to when I could do fun matches occasionally, even in WCW. There was a lot of fun stuff. I detailed one of the matches that me and uh, Sullivan had against the Nasties where he Harley lectured me afterwards for being too silly out there, including the, the cup I thought was a full beer. I thought the reason the guy was like, no, trying to protest against me grabbing his cup was he didn't want to waste a beer and then as I throw it oh. it's in mid throw and I see it and I was like that's not an amber colored uh, <laughs> pilsner beer this is tobacco this, spit. this is yeah 18 ounces tobacco juice and it's like in Nobby's eyes <laughs> coming out of his nostrils so there was some silly stuff I did but I thought there was a time and a place for the uh, ooh, for the for the really physical stuff real a strong style and uh, but on that night in in I in uh, New Orleans, I intended to end my career because I was just so frustrated. I was so frustrated. I had the Lloyd's of London policy. Granted, it wasn't going to be a, a huge sum of money because I was only making one fifty. But you're talking about wrestler after wrestler who'd who'd been given big sums of money, all of them from Minnesota. Maybe yes, that was the yes. deal. I wasn't from Minnesota. 
Uh, but it was Road Warrior Animal, it was Kurt Hennig, yes. it was Ricky Steamboat. I mean, just over and over. I was like, how could I possibly ever Rick wrestle? Got it. Yeah, yeah, Rick Rude got it. How could I ever wrestle again if I'm on this guy's back? Mm -hmm. And he drops backwards and kicks his feet up, drops backwards, he's 450 pounds, wooden ramp. No way can I ever wrestle again, which is what I wanted at that point, to never wrestle again. Well, Eric Bischoff even wrote about this day in his book. Um, he talked about, maybe you had a different idea. Quote, that was the precursor for Cactus Jack leaving WCW. Cactus was becoming not only a danger to himself, but in the opinion of WCW legal, was providing a significant amount of litigation exposure uh, because of the things he wanted to do. It was over the top. Every week it was something crazier and crazier and crazier, and we couldn't let it happen. In addition to probably other things, I never talked to Mick about this, and maybe we will someday. That was the straw that broke the camel's back with WCW and Mick. He wanted to become more physical and more violent, bloodier, and more over the top. WCW was going a different direction. But this is all when he was asked, is it true that you wanted to jump off of a balcony at Halloween Havoc? And that you were shut down for that. Do you remember, I know we did the big squisher spot or whatever we want to call it with you and Vader's back on the mm -hmm. ramp. Do you remember suggesting to anyone, what if I jumped off of that in regard to a balcony? I'd like going off the high stuff. <laughs> Uncle Conrad, I did, I did like it. Yeah. I thought I specifically brought that up September of uh, uh, 94. But it was like the dream was always to drop an elbow off the TV truck. Not mm -hmm. just because it'd be a cool bump, but because of the way it could be filmed. Yeah, coming down. Onto the hood of a car, you relax the shocks a little bit. It looks like I'm sailing into your living room. So yeah, I did, uh, I can't, uh, well, listen, that's a very legitimate reason. I don't remember anyone sitting down and telling me that. I'm not saying they did not do that. Um, when I heard that from Eric, uh, you know, not from me directly, but through the book and uh, hearing him talk about it on podcast, I was like, okay, I, I yeah, that's a legitimate, that's a legit, that's a legitimate concern. That's a legitimate concern. But uh, this is the most griping I think I've ever done on an episode. I want to make it clear that if everything had worked out like I hoped it would that night. Well, for, for, I mean, leading up to it, mm -hmm. where I wouldn't enter the match with the <laughs> this end game of hopefully never wrestling again. Uh, even if things had gone perfectly, they could not have worked out as well as they did. That's right. So, oh, um, I think, you know, in one of my books, I said, I'm not sure if everything happens for a reason or if the the choices we make based on the circumstances we find ourselves in go on to define who we are as human beings. And so I did have some circumstances that I thought were difficult. And I think uh, the way I addressed them, you know, by going out, by giving my notice, by going out, working harder, making myself a valuable, commo valuable commodity. Winning the tag titles on notice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, then they treated me well. They yes. didn't job me out, right? They, I mean, that's it, a vote of confidence. It is. Though. It was really nice Trust. of them to do that. They treated me well. I didn't give them two weeks' notice. I gave them two months. Yeah. I just said, you know, when I said, I said, I'm not going to resign. No, I know Eric even asked me at DDP's uh, uh, Christmas party just a few months after I left. Did we let you go, or did you? I said, well, I told you guys, you know, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't resign. right resigned. Now, not one time did anyone sit me down and ask me if I would reconsider. But they pushed me. Yes. They gave me the t tag titles with Kevin. I was able to do an angle with Kevin. Uh, on the way out, I was able to do a loser leave town that had a push to it. Mm -hmm. I was able to leave Kevin Sullivan laying, you know, uh, during the angle leading up to it. Considering I traveled 40 straight hours to make it to uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and only got to the <laughs> event 10 minutes before we went on the air. And I think we discussed this. You know, Kevin wasn't big about going over spots anyway. And I was like, Kevin, I want you to slam me off the, uh, <laughs> off the second rope to the concrete. And my music's playing. And he goes, brother, do I stand on the ring apron or the floor? I go, 
Kevin, if you're standing on the floor, you'll never reach me. And out I go. So we got one spot, which is Kevin slamming me off the second turnbuckle to the floor and had ourselves a, a pretty good match. So thank you to the powers that be, and I guess that's Eric, uh, for giving me a good send-off, you know, um, and opening up a whole new world of opportunities. So in reliving this stuff, just like I felt when I was doing the writing and mm -hmm. I'm reliving it, it brings, I think it should bring up a little bit of frustration, yes. right? I guess, you That's know, you felt we're passionate time. about it. And I think uh, Bret Hart and I have been compared in the way, not in what we did in the rings, we had a very different styles, right? But the fact that people are like, it's, why do they care so much, you know? like, And it's like, you know what? If we didn't care. It wouldn't have been as good. It, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be here talking about no. a career that nobody would remember. You yes. know, if I shrugged it off, like, ah, you know, I'm making the money. I'm making six figures. You know, I wanted everything to be good. I wanted to make a difference. Going back to seeing Snuka just a little over 40 years ago, 40 years this month, when I turned around and said, I want to make, I you know, said to myself, I want to make people feel the way I feel right now. That was still the goal, to create those moments. And, you know, I was working with a very limited genetic hand, and I had things I wanted to do. So, uh, you know, look, Eric, Eric's feeling was not that much different than Vince's, especially even when I came into WWE and uh, Jerry Briscoe asked me what I could do to The Undertaker that would look good and believable. I said, I can drop an elbow off the TV truck. And he goes, we know you do some wild things. There may come a time when we ask you to do one of those, but until we do, we ask that you do not. And right there, that's what allowed me to put in four full-time years. Yes. So I think if someone had sat me down and had that same talk in WCW, you know, I'd still could be that. It could have been different. I'd still be that low six-figure guy. I don't know if I would have been content. Um, you wouldn't have been. Probably not. And so you I, want to be creatively fulfilled. I mean, that's the reason uh, yeah. you cared as much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love this match, and uh, I know you know now since we're pals, it's uh, it's a little harder to watch because you're taking a whole bunch of punishment. Sure. But I want to recommend that everybody go out of their way to see it. You do some incredible stuff in this. Uh, there's some crazy stuff with guardrails and chairs. One of the more underrated bumps, I think, besides the big squish bump on the ramp, is you doing a sunset flip off the apron to the floor. It's just crazy when you think about it, but hey, listen, it's a Texas death match. You're doing what you can. Trying to get that fall. Now, a sunset flip probably is not going to keep. Well, Big falls Van don't Vader. even count. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Well, they, you do get the three count, yes. but then they have 10 seconds to get up. Yes. So it's not like a sunset flip. But after with, you yeah. did the sunset flip, right. I'd be worried about you standing yeah. up after 10 seconds. One of my favorite moves, I think we covered this buried alive match. Yes. Undertaker goes to slam me on top of the grave, and I small packaged him down the... <laughs> An all-timer. An all-timer. <laughs> we know you guys are both going to bleed here. Tony Schiavone has even said on his podcast that he was nervous about you guys bleeding so much and in and around the ringside area. Again, this is a different time. Blood is much yeah. more common back then. But we're pretty fresh off of the whole Magic Johnson HIV scare, and it's... A I was actually, you know, I love the winning time show. Love Can it. Can you believe that's over? It's canceled. I know, two seasons. Unbelievable. But oh, it was a magical while it lasted. Yes, yes. I remember being with Abdullah the Butcher. <laughs> Abdullah the Butcher and I were on the beach taking a walk in Los Angeles when we got the news about magic. He did his uh, press conference at the Forum Club, and we worked that night in Inglewood at the Forum. Uh, but you're right. It was not that far removed from the scare. And that was a very real concern, especially when you were a guy who did matches that led to the bloody stuff. Meltzer loved the match. He gave it four and three quarter stars. But he says, this was an incredible match marred by an incredibly bad finish. Oh, yeah. Harley Ray shot Jack with a stun gun, so he couldn't get up from the 10 count. What's next? A straight edge razor, a switchblade, well, finally a 44 magnet. My finish is the moral victory. Yes. I take the power bomb, and unlike six months, three months earlier, four months earlier, whatever the case was, where I was stretchered out, I get up under my own power, 
dramatic, and then Leon levels me with something else big. And I was told, we can't do that because he's working with... Mm -hmm. Said it's like, give them a... Ah, give them a finish that they can believe in and go home. The moral victory would have been enough. Yeah, yeah, I I was ixnate on that. That was my that was my finish. Power bomb on the on the ramp. Followed. I would beat the ten count, and then the next thing would put me down for good. It's such a, a tale of two lives here, almost. You know, you, you're writing about how this is, you know, the peak of your career at that point. It's your first time in a real WCW main event. It's your kind of match, and you know you're never going to get it again. You wrote about that when you're sort of recapping this radio call-in show where they asked or fan asked, what was the highlight of your career? And he said it was that night, right before mm -hmm. you hit Vader with that out foreign object on the outside of the ring. But then you realized it'll never be like this again. Fortunately, you were wrong. I was wrong. And we were wrong. We're having a lot of fun and we're so glad you guys are along with the ride for us. Check us out on YouTube, Foley on youtube.com. Be sure to uh, get your questions in for next month's show. It's at Foley is pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Of course, you can keep up with Mick over on Instagram at real Mick Foley. He's also on Facebook at real Mick Foley and real Mick Foley.com is where you can keep up with all things Mick and when he's coming to your town. Conrad, when is the, when is the air date for this uh, episode? Uh, this weekend. So this weekend. Like right now. Like. All right. October 31st, Halloween special. Cameos, half price all day. 70, How about that? $75. So, so you got to do it on the website, though. Cameo cameo.com. Cameo.com slash, uh, slash Mick Foley. There's no code to enter. I'm just going to drop the price by uh, 50%. So it'll go from 149 to 70, you know, 75. How about that little trick or treat uh, yeah, action? Yeah, but we're only do, going to do 20 of them. So if you want to get in, uh, place that order on the 31st. Halloween on Halloween, special. there it there is. Cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley. And we'll see you guys sooner rather than later right here on Foley is Pod. How about a hand for Mick? Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> we had music on the show today. Yeah, we sure did. Live music. We have just raised the bar to a level that uh, I don't think there's been other live band performances on any other wrestling podcast. No, can't. Uh, can you? No, not a wrestling yeah. podcast. I don't yeah. think so. Let's oh, see. Wow. Okay, it's, no pressure, but we'll see you in a month. It's the new standard, brother. New standard. I like it. Yeah. See you guys next time. All right, right thanks, here Conrad. on Foley's Pod. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what AdFreeShows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad-free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like title chase, Eric fires back conversations with Conrad and the insiders. Plus new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early. You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today, and hey, when you do, the first week is completely free, adfreeshows.com.